Okay, so this is a genuine disclaimer, I'm not capping here. I'm going to be spoiling the entire series. Meaning that, like, the next 10 years of you following this series, you're essentially going to know all of the major plot points, who all of these characters are, what their motivations are, and where it's ultimately all headed. I can't tell you absolutely everything, of course, so you at least have that little bit of enjoyment with the rest of the series. You know, however, one and Barada decide to alter or, you know, play the story as it goes forward, but I can assure you, 100% that what I'm going to be talking about in this video is going to happen in the series because most of it has already happened. So just keep that in mind. I won't blame you if you don't want to watch this video. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's get into it because I've been working on this video for like two months. If you've been wondering why I haven't been talking about the God stuff, you know, since we saw him, you know, reveal in chapter 153 or, or whatever it's going to be, you know, wound up being numbered by Murata and one. But it's because when I saw that, like God come in front of Homeless Emperor, you know, the iconic colored spread, that was the beginning of the end for me that caused me to go in a rabbit hole that I am only now showing the world so I'll show you the path that I took and where it eventually leads which is us knowing everything about the series basically so when God appeared in front of homeless emperor and we saw like his meaty boneless form it reminded me immediately of Hellraiser a movie that I had just coincidentally seen a couple months prior honestly I there's no reason I would have seen this movie except for someone just suggested it to me and I just happened to watch it and I thought it was interesting and I wound up watching the sequel right after it but that's where it ended until I saw this depiction of God. So then my mind started racing and instead of using Occam's razor, I started using Zonin's razor, but surprisingly, it actually led me to the truth. So then I watched Hellraiser and then I was like, oh my God, one loves Hellraiser and or Clive Barker's writing. And then I watched Hellraiser 2 and then I was like, oh my God, he really does. And then I watched Hellraiser 3 and I was like, okay, this is it. This is where this part of the story is coming from. But then when I finished Hellraiser 3, it led me to the ultimate truth. So let me just explain Hellraiser to you real quick before I go into these movies. So essentially Hellraiser is about these cubes. I know, cubes, right? And we'll get into it. Anyway, these cubes exist in the world. And if you find them and can solve it, then you like open this dimension to like a hell-like world where these Cenobites come through the, you know, the iconic pinhead character that we see. And they give you an experience that is pain and pleasure indivisible. That's essentially what Hellraiser is about. So Hellraiser 1 opens up with this couple, Julia and Larry, going to this house. Now this house is, I guess, Larry's or something, and his brother Frank was living there. But his brother, like, I don't know, died upstairs in his room or something. Julia and Larry go upstairs and whatever happens, and Larry winds up getting cut on his hand and the blood drips onto the floor and goes beneath the floorboards and like the, I don't know, residual corpsiness of Frank that was left behind absorbs the blood. And he starts to come back as like a circulatory system or just a base form of a human. So that right there was the beginning of the end because if you haven't seen where I'm going right now, you're about to. So remember when Orochi first died by Saitama before all the retcons, even though it doesn't matter because it's still going to all line up the same way. But anyway, when Orochi came back, he was like that goopy heart form and all that he wanted was blood, right? Because blood would make him regain his strength. Well, coincidentally, that is the same thing that Frank once in this movie, he wants blood to regain his strength so that he regains his form to come back to the real world. Well, now you're saying, well, that's not Orochi. Of course it's not, it's God. This is the story of God. But um, let's just keep going more into the, uh, the Hellraiser stuff. So Frank explains that he was trapped in the Hell Dimension and the blood that dripped onto the floor from his brother was able to like somehow bring him back. Clive Barker, the director and writer of Hellraiser, doesn't really explain this too much in the movie. I guess because the studio thought maybe they have to cut back on the exposition because, you know, the normies watching wouldn't be able to follow it. But anyway, this relationship that we're seeing here is essentially the same as Psychos and Orochi and God because this woman, Julia, is Psychos, but they are both based off of the same character. 
and I'll get into that later on. So later on in Hellraiser, we see this homeless guy uh, with long black hair and a beard. I know, iconic to homeless people, but also similar to another person that we're familiar with from One Punch Man. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but you know, maybe everything in this video is a coincidence and confirmation bias. Let me just get that out of the way, because obviously this is all not proven yet, and it doesn't matter how confident I am, this could all just not be true in the end. But anyway, we see this homeless guy in the movie throughout, and he's always like watching them. Whoever is involved with the cube or tied to the people who are involved with the cube. So that's pretty interesting, right? Homeless Emperor, if you haven't caught on to where I'm trying to make the connection yet. So Julia loves Frank because things that I can't really talk about on YouTube, but she'll do anything for him, such as bring him innocent people for him to drain their blood so that he can regain his form. Uh, and he does this slowly. Like first he comes back as like the circulatory system and the goopiness or whatever. Then he gains some nerves and more tissue and stuff. But then he gains like muscle and ligaments and it winds up coming down to him needing skin as like the final layer. And that's kind of how we see God, right? Or at least the three versions that we see of God. Yes, this is all one God. It's not three different ones, or at least I'm pretty sure it's not. That's because it's representing the same kind of dynamic that's going on here. God needs all of this blood because like Frank here, he needs to regain his form. What we see of him in this fetal position is where he is currently. Like he's at the musculature form and him coming back to earth, I'm assuming will give him his skin, but uh, you know, we'll get more into that later. Anyway, towards the end of the movie, the MC Christie winds up solving the cube and she goes to like the hell razor to Mention. And then suddenly these creatures are able to come through into her world, essentially monsters, if you will. And I think that's a pretty interesting part here because, uh, you know, this could be telling us the origin of monsters. But anyway, at the end of the movie, a homeless emperor collects the cube and then transforms into some bone demon devil monster and then flies away. So I looked into this guy and it turns out he is the cube guardian. He's always depicted as some kind of like homeless gentleman or something. So that right there is obviously a connection to Homeless Emperor with God and everything, you know, so in case you were wondering, that's where I guess one got the idea for Homeless Emperor because that is kind of like a bizarre idea for a character, right? All right, so if you thought that was interesting, well, just get ready because we're going to Hellraiser 2 now. This is like where Clive Barker, I guess, was given free reign by the studio and was allowed to do almost anything he wanted, which is also why I guess Hellraiser imploded the way that it did. But anyway, opening up with Hellraiser 2, we see Pinhead as a human with the cube. It turns out that Pinhead was a soldier during the war. They don't make it explicit what war it is, but I guess it was like World War II or something. And the cube took him to the Hellraiser dimension. So this means that Pinhead, uh, the Cenobite, the demon, was once a human. So then later on in the movie, we see that there are multiple cubes that exist, not just one just like in One Punch Man. And then this next stuff that I'm gonna be going into isn't explained in the movie. And in fact, I'm pretty sure we only see it for like one frame. We see like this newspaper that says, children of the vortex, puberty link with psychic phenomena. Uh oh, there's the keyword, psychic, cube, God. All three of these words are in Hellraiser, but they're also in One Punch Man and they all connect the same way. The Trinity, that's where this is all headed, guys. Everything is connected by three. Not just with One Punch Man, but just stories and writing and everything. But the main trinity, aside from God, Cube, Psychic, is Hellraiser, One Punch Man, but they all connect to Egypt or Egyptian mythology. Because the next thing that we see in this sequence is Egyptian iconography behind this doctor guy, who is Orochi. I know, I'll get into it. So this is where it really started to get out of control because once I saw the Egypt stuff, it made me think about the Egypt stuff that we saw in the table of contents of volume 21 or volume 23, I don't remember. It's gonna say it right here, this is the volume number. But there's Egyptian stuff there and also when we see the mural, you know, for the prophecy of God, it's like Egyptian hieroglyphics inspired, right? It looks like that stuff. So that's telling me that it is true. All of this is dating back to Egyptian times. That's where this is all kind of starting, not just 
for One Punch Man, but for Hellraiser. So also during this sequence, we see like this mattress. Now, remember when I said uh, in Hellraiser 1, in Frank's room, he like died there or something, so that when blood was placed on the area where he died, he was able to absorb the blood and then come back to the real world. Well, when Julia died in the first movie, she died on this mattress, and this doctor guy, who was Orochi, by the way, has one of his patients bleed on this mattress, and that completes the ritual to bring Julia back from the cube world, similar to how the mural was with the altar. You know, place a worthy sacrifice, our god will come back, blah, blah, blah. So then later on, we see this little girl, and we're starting to see, okay, children of the vortex, puberty link with psychic phenomenon. This little girl is always kind of like working on puzzles and stuff. That's like her thing in this movie. She doesn't really talk. But anyway, this little girl is Tatsumaki. Let's just get that out of the way here. But anyway, later on, we come back to Julia, a.k.a. Psychos, who has now regained her form, just like how Frank did in the first movie by absorbing the blood of people that the doctor had brought her. Pretty interesting colored dress that she's wearing now, right? But anyway, we're coming to the MC Christie from the first movie, who's actually Fubuki. And Fubuki and Tatsumaki get together here and start basically figuring out a way to solve the plot of this movie. And it starts coming together that, oh... Tatsumaki is here because she was being experimented on by the doctor to work with the cube so that they could summon the Cenobites, aka God, so that she can work with the cube to get the power of God, because that's where this is all headed. But anyway, Tatsumaki was also in like a lab type facility when she was younger, obviously, and we saw when Blast broke her out of there, he had a cube in his hand. So that straight up confirms for sure that Tatsumaki was in that psychic facility for the cube. They bought her, by the way, that's like her backstory. She was purchased by these lab people, by her foster parents. Keep that in mind. Tatsumaki is an orphan, so is Fubuki, because we're going to get into that. But yeah, they wanted Tatsumaki to use her psychic abilities to awaken the power of the cube. And I guess they did to an extent, because like we see in Hellraiser 2, the girl does open the dimension by solving the cube. I'm assuming Tatsumaki does the same thing, and that's how that big monster comes because that's essentially where all monsters come from. They're like some kind of alien or interdimensional species or something. I'll get more into it. But anyway, back to the movie. When Fubuki and Tatsumaki reactivate the cube and they meet Pinhead again, we see that Pinhead remembers Christie's name. But also it's a callback to the first movie that Pinhead remembered Frank. He keeps track of all of the people that he has made deals with. Just like how God has, right? Or at least we're led to believe that. God remembered the name of Blast, which insinuated that he has a history with Blast because he does. Not because Blast made a deal with God. Uh, I, I think I think he might be similar to Tatsumaki, but we'll get into that. So we come back to Psychos with human Orochi, and they're in the god world now, and Psychos is revealing to human Orochi who her god is, and it turns out that it's Leviathan, the god of the labyrinth. This guy right here, this is our boy. This is God. But, you know, it's not like God is him and he is God. Both of these guys are based off of the same character, just like Psychos and Julia, and just like the Doctor and Orochi. Also, fun little fact, in this sequence, Leviathan is making this horn sound, which apparently is Morse code for God. Leviathan telling everyone that he is God, despite him, you know, not literally being God similar to how God does in One Punch Man. But anyway, we see that Psychos tricks the doctor and gives him to God on the altar, and it transforms the doctor into this monstrosity who is Orochi. Like, look, you know, like, they're both Orochi. Because like I said, they're both based off of the same deity. It all goes back to the snake stuff. Another interesting thing about this hell world that they're in, the labyrinth, that Leviathan looks over. It's very similar to like the Monster Association. Obviously, it's not one for one recreation. I mean, we saw that one area was already an area that exists in Indonesia or something. But for the most part, like the architecture and why it looks all weird and labyrinthy like that, it's because of this. But anyway, later on in the movie, uh, it's revealed that the Cenobites were in fact all humans once, you know, like we talked about in the first movie. But then for some reason, they wind up fighting the Orochi Cenobite guy. I don't know why. Why? It's never really explained. They're both serving the same god. But look how he fights. He like shoots lasers and stuff. That's pretty interesting, right? I mean, aside from just using like the dragon snake tentacle hands. But also, he's fighting Tatsu.
Tatsumaki here. Because you know, like how Tatsumaki fights Orochi in One Punch Man. Because, you know, like I said, they're both based off of the same thing. These two characters fight each other in the mythology anyway. And I know this is a little hard to believe because, you know, I'm not equating this to Japanese mythology. Maybe you'd believe me if I said Crab has conflict with Dog. So I understand it's a little hard to believe that Psychic Girl has conflict with Snake Monster. <laughs> But anyway, Tatsumaki does something and eventually winds up defeating Orochi and therefore God at the same time, but not like killing God, but I don't know, foiling his plan. And when the like souls are implied, I guess, to be escaping from him, they look like homeless emperor's light spheres. But anyway, at the end of the movie, we come back to the altar, the mattress once again, and like this pillar comes out of it and we see homeless emperor's face again. But that takes us to the third movie, which is by far the worst of the three. And we come back to this altar that has come out of the ground, but now we see See that Pinhead is taking up the role of the person who tries to convince a human to give them blood or a sacrifice to bring them back to the world. But we essentially get the, you know, prophecy, Orochi, bringing back God thing here. And it leads to Pinhead coming back to the world and killing humanity because he hates them for some reason, similar to God. But anyway, we're getting more information on the backstory of Pinhead because his human consciousness, which came back in the second movie, when the doctor shot him with a Orochi's beam and made him become a human again, that like separated him from his pinhead monster consciousness. Again, this was like written in 1990 or, or something, so you know, things were different then. But anyway, I'm telling you this for a reason because this human consciousness of the original form of pinhead meets the MC of this movie in what he says a limbo between heaven and hell. It's like uh, connects dreams or something. This is the place that we see like Psychos and Fubuki and Phoenix Man and Child Emperor go to. This is like that Esper meeting ground that, that they've always been going to. This could be also the same place where we see God take Homeless Emperor. It's basically like this neutral ground where people that have this like Esper ability or whatever can meet and talk. But anyway, he says, I can't act in your world, but you can. The war destroyed my generation. He says something like if they weren't killed by the war then like drugs and vices killed them but drugs and vices weren't his thing he more so was like seeking thrills so he went out and found the lamnet configuration which is the cube in, in the hellraiser lore and he inadvertently became a servant of leviathan here and we do know that there was a war in one punch man or actually many wars and i'll get into that because i'm pretty sure god is the reason for those wars i'm pretty positive there is a character from the war who like became monsterfied because of it and maybe didn't want to be and they possibly exist right now in the story but we're not aware of who they are. But anyway, remember I said Pinhead is released from the pillar and he's like killing people and stuff. And he gives this monologue about hating humans for some reason, similar to how God does. And uh, But also Pinhead needs the cube to be given to him. He cannot take it. And he wants to destroy the cube because if he destroys the cube, then there's no longer a portal between the Hellraiser world and Earth so that Pinhead can always stay in Earth and rule it essentially, I guess. Pin is also able to like deceive people and make kind of like genjutsus, like he can go into your mind and then make you think that he's somebody else and convince you of something, you know, that typical villainous trope ability. But I think that might come back into play in the later parts of the story, maybe. You might see that correlate to another lore that this is based off of as well. But anyway, the movie ends with like Pinhead getting sealed again by his human form in the MC. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But the end ending shot of the movie ends with us seeing like this corporation and the laminate configuration markings are all over it. It means that, you know, Leviathan even has influence over the corporate world, which of course is an element going into One Punch Man. Okay. So I'm finally getting around to making my series of videos that's going to be explaining the truth about One Punch Man. I'm gonna be starting with this one, explaining who Saitama actually is, or more so what he is based off of, and that will show us what the overall series is about and where it's headed. It's gonna take me many videos to explain all of this stuff, so please subscribe because, you know, over the next couple weeks, I'm gonna be releasing them. So let's just get it out there immediately. Saitama is the Egyptian god of the sun, Ra, and he 
kind of always was. And more so, the story of One Punch Man was always kind of the myth of Osiris in a way. It's not a one-for-one -one recreation, of course, just similar in the way that like Naruto and One Piece aren't one-for-one -one recreations of Tale of the Bamboo Cutter, but it's more or less kind of following the same path. And there is some Tale of the Bamboo Cutter in One Punch Man as well, but it also ties back to the myth of Osiris and just Egyptian mythology in general. So first, let me just give you Wikipedia's description of Ra, and that way I could further expand upon how he is Saitama and how Saitama is him. So Ra was the Egyptian deity of the sun. He had become one of the most important gods in Egyptian religion, identified primarily with the noonday sun. Ra was believed to rule in all parts of the created world, the sky, the earth, and the underworld. He was the god of the sun, order, kings and the sky. Since the people regarded Ra as a principal god, creator of the universe and source of life, he had a strong influence on them, which led to him being one of the most worshipped of all Egyptian gods and even considered king of the gods. At an early period in Egyptian history, his influence spread throughout the whole country, bringing multiple representations in form and in name. The most common form combinations are with Atum, his human form, and Kepri, the scarab beetle, and Horus, the falcon. So let's just stop there for a second. So the most obvious example of this is King. king King is Atom and Saitama's human form. And I've obviously been talking about this for years and it was right in front of my face the whole time. Notice how I've always been saying that Saitama and King are two sides of the same coin. They both represent absolute power. King is who everyone sees as absolute power. However, Saitama is literally the absolute power. And of course, this was always purposely crafted by one, but the more significant meaning is this. Ra is a god who goes by many names. And that is why King's name is King because, you know, Saitama is like the true king. They're the king of gods, just like how Ra was. Also, another reason why all of Saitama's huge feats in the beginning of the series are associated with King. Defeating Vaccine Man, defeating Beefcake, etc. This is also why the sequence of Saitama meeting King plays out the way that it does. When we see King before he becomes an S-Class hero, he's encountered by the Octopus Claw Man. But if you'll look closer, you'll see that the Octopus Claw Man represents the moon and his left eye is being slashed. That's because the left represents the eye of Horus and the right represents the eye of Ra. But I'll get more into the eye symbology in a little bit. But also when King is saved by Saitama, he is first seen with the sun glaring behind him the light coming down on King. Now, Kepri, on the other hand, is a little more ambiguous to the story, but it does make sense, and I think this will be more prevalent in future developments that are actually currently happening right now, and we'll come back to Kepri, but right now I'll just say that he's very likely to be Zombie Man, and I know that sounds far-fetched, like, Zombie Man, he's not really that important. Well, maybe not right now, but it's very likely that he is going to become extremely important later on in the story, and more so heavily tied to Saitama. But like I said, I'll come back to Kepri because there actually is symbology for him, just like there is symbology for many things in this story, and it's pretty cool. So going back to Ra, on top of his head sits a solar disc with a cobra, which in many myths represent the eye of Ra. Okay, let's stop there. So as we can see, this is how Ra is depicted, Falcon's head with the sun on top. This symbology has always been present to us within the series. In fact, it's been present even before One Punch Man was a thing, because some of you hardcores out there know that one's like original kind of story story for this was called Tayo Man, and Tayo means sun, sun man, Ra, god of the sun. And I'm pretty sure that's why Saitama is bald, to represent the sun. That's like it. That's like the main reasoning behind it. I mean, aside from that, just being bald makes him iconic and stick out from the rest of the cookie cutter manga heroes. But it more so just represents that he is Ra. God of the Sun. And another way that one cleverly shows us this is back in the martial arts tournament. When Saitama puts on his Shiranko wig, that is representing the sun and that he is 
Ra. Also, when Saitama takes up the name of Shiranko in that tournament, it goes back to Ra being a god who goes by many names. And just a little side note here, another symbology that we see in the martial arts tournament is Garo wearing the Wolfman mask. That is meant to represent that he is Anubis. And yes, I'll talk about him in another video, as well as all of the other S-Class heroes and characters in this series who are based on Egyptian gods. It does not stop with Saitama, King, and Zombie Man. It goes much, much deeper than that. But also the Eye of Ra is mentioned here. And if you follow my videos, you know lately I've been talking about how one uses left and right symbology, especially with the eyes. And this is where it's coming from. Right eye represents the eye of Ra, which, you know, is the good, the light, the sun, Saitama. As where the left eye is the eye of Horus. That represents the moon, bad things, darkness, and God, like the character from One Punch Man. Again, I'll be explaining all of this in much further detail later on in another video. Just that right there should already be able to show you the truth about most of these characters, and that's because we see the singular eye represented so much within this series. And whenever you see that, it is for sure telling us that they are a disciple of God because they are bearing the eye of Horus. Now, which characters exhibit these eyes? Well, Boros, of course. That's because Boros was always kind of in one's mind. I mean, you could see that he was a part of Tayo Man originally with the whole 20 years, too strong villain thing. And I've been talking about this for a long time, that Boros is connected to God in some way. And he pretty much is, and I'll explain that later, but the most prominent singular eye that we see is Drive Knight. That's because Drive Knight is Horus. But Drive Knight, aka Horus, is just ultimately a disciple of Osiris, who is God. Goes back to the myth of Osiris. And that's just what this whole series comes down to. The sun versus the moon. Saitama versus God. You've probably heard me say in, I don't know, a few videos or something that I really like One Punch Man because I feel like it's like the perfect fusion of Dragon Ball Z and One Piece. You get like the one-dimensional strong fighting guys aspect of Dragon Ball Z combined with the three-dimensional aspects of One Piece with world building, character development, and extensive lore. But little did I know, I was much closer to the truth than I actually knew. Because they're both telling the same story, which is just the sun versus the moon. One Piece ultimately comes down to sun god Nika versus the moon goddess Emu. And it just doesn't stop there. I guess this is really the origin of all storytelling, because the sun and the moon obviously have always been a thing <laughs> as long as humanity has been around. The sun gives light, brings the day, brings life, but when the moon comes out, then the darkness comes and it takes away the light and the sun goes away. Brings fear, other things like that. So the age old story of humanity has always been the sun versus the moon or the light versus the dark. But back to the Ra mythology. Ra was believed to have created all forms of life by calling them into existence by uttering their secret names. In some accounts, humans were created from Ra's tears and sweat. And we actually do do see this happening in chapter 86, which is, I guess, the most important chapter in the series, possibly, next to like chapter 22. So in that chapter, we see Dr. Genus explaining the limiter and just monsters in general to Zombie Man. Remember, it could be Kepri. And this also, again, shows the genius of one's writing because he is literally telling us the truth here, but he's just disguising it as like normal dialogue. So when he's explaining the limiter to Zombie Man, he says, no matter how much an organism strives, there are limits to its growth. An overabundance of strength is a burden to its bearer. For that reason, God has designed each creature to grow within parameters that allow for survival and preservation of reason. And the mechanism for controlling that growth is called a limiter. So that statement right there has obviously been talked about and I for years and I personally have been asked like is Dr. Genus talking about the God character there and I always thought like well no because how would Dr. Genus know about God and if he did he would just tell zombie men and this goes back to one telling us the truth but disguising it as just normal harmless dialogue. Dr. Genus the character himself is just saying God as like you know nature or whatever but one himself literally means God the character here, aka Osiris, because God has literally done this to all of the organisms 
I, I think pretty much in the universe maybe I'm not really sure how far his reach goes at this point but we have gotten some more insight into that with blasts Green Lantern Corps thing. But God has done this. He has put a limiter onto living beings so that they can only become so strong as to where they cannot challenge him the way that Saitama eventually will. And in another video, I'll explain how he has done this because that too has been shown to us. The reason why people become monsters and the way that God's system has been imposed on, I guess, most life-bearing planets. And that too is pretty genius how one did it. But going further, Dr. Genus says regarding Saitama, but that man, he forced himself beyond his boundaries and thereby succeeding in removing his limiter. And he suffers suffocating isolation. After he defeated my greatest warrior with a single punch, the look on his face told it all. And Carnage Kabuto is actually kind of important too, because it goes back to the whole Kepri thing. The most common raw form combinations are with Atom, King, his human form, and Kepri, the Scarab Beetle, along with Horus the Falcon. Now, what was Carnage Kabuto originally referred to as? The ultimate life form. Obviously, it was not him. The ultimate life form is Saitama. And also, in this chapter, we see a little hanging ornament thing of Carnage Kabuto. And in the final page of Dr. Genus's exposition here, we see it hanging over Zombie Man's head. And Kepri is often represented as a scarab holding aloft the morning sun or a scarab headed man. And I won't really go too much into spoilers here, but it's not a coincidence what's going on with Zombie Man right now in the webcomic, especially since Kepri is associated with being the god of resurrection. But anyway, going further, Zombie Man says, I know many monsters who disregard their strength limits. When they don't become actual monsters, the world calls them heroes. And then Dr. Gina says, when humans become monsters, there's an explosion of frustration resulting from unsatisfied desires and the urge to transform. Driven by destructive behaviors and psychological complexes, the individual's past circumstances and other factors may give rise to cellular abnormalities and spontaneous mutation. These are reborn as new creatures, but they retain their limiters. Broadly speaking, the sea folk who attacked City J and the aliens who attacked City A were also monsters, but they were natural creatures with an innate animosity towards humankind. Again, Boros is shown here with the Eye of Horus, he is for sure a product of God in some way. It is not a coincidence that he was sent to Earth, especially with the alien seer looking Lovecraftian, similar to how Orochi does. But then going further, he says, by contrast, heroes work hard to develop innate talents, thereby acquiring the incredible powers that allow them to stand against monsters. And then he goes on to talk about Saitama some more, and he says, but he was different. He was a normal person of ordinary birth with an ordinary lifestyle and no particular talent. Yet through sheer effort, he forced open his limits and demolished his limiter. Now, what do we see in this panel right here? Saitama sweating, and he has a tear coming from his eye. Going back to what we talked about with Ra, man was created from Ra's tears and sweat. Saitama's tears and sweat, which he gave for many days in order to remove his limiter, gave birth to someone who was strong enough to overcome God and stop the cycle. Therefore, giving birth to the true humans who are no longer under the influence of God's system. This is, of course, the end result of the series, but that's where I want to end the video because I don't know how long it's going to be at this point, but like I said, there's so much more that I need to talk about, and I'll just give you a little preview as to what's to come. I'm going to talk about the truth about Drive Knight, of course, about how he is the most significant villain in the series outside of God. I'm going to be explaining God himself because he has a whole other rabbit hole to him and it's actually been shown to us in the series the truth about him and where the story is headed with him as well also going to be talking about the psychic sisters and which one of them is going to wind up being with Saitama yes that's going to be a thing going to be talking more about Psychos Orochi talking more about Genos and Metal Knight and Drive Knight and how all three of their storylines are going to converge in a pretty cool way and of course in that video I'll explain why Metal Knight wasn't a villainous traitor the whole time and where his base is actually located probably also why people become monsters and the system that god has put in place and then eventually i'll be explaining what the next 
big arc of One Punch Man is going to be, which is already kind of being set up right now in the webcomic, and why Drive Knight and Psychos are going to defeat Saitama. Yes, it is going to happen, but I mean, he'll come back and win eventually, but there will be a point where he is defeat. Okay, so in this one, I'm going to be continuing my video series on the truth about One Punch Man. Last time, we talked about how Saitama represented Ra, the god of the sun. And in this one, we're going to be talking about God, who represents Osiris, the god of the moon. Now, before I get into Osiris and all of the other mythologies that go into crafting this character, first, let me just explain who God is in the One Punch Man series. So he's essentially the main villain of One Punch Man. He's the antithesis of Saitama. As I mentioned before, Saitama is the sun, well, God is the moon light versus dark. And we first see God in Homeless Emperor's flashback exposition explaining to Zombie Man how he received his powers. Homeless Emperor was basically going to like off himself because of what humanity has done to the earth. I mean, there's other variables, but that was like the main thing. And God appeared in front of him like in an ethereal circulatory system type form and said, hey, you know, you're not wrong about humans being foolish, but you need not die. And then he gave him his energy manipulation abilities that we see him use many times throughout the series and basically sent him on a quest to I guess, take out humanity, or at least as much as he could. Later on, we see God in a different form. After Saitama, Monaco, and Flashy Flash come in contact with the mysterious black cube, this allows them to see through like a wormhole almost, and we see God in like a fetal position, but this time he's in like a musculature form, almost like a human without skin. And more recently in the manga, we see him yet again. This is after Zombie Man was able to overcome Homeless Emperor and starts questioning him about God. Before Homeless Emperor can say anything about him to Zombie Man, he appears in front of Homeless Emperor. This form that we see of God is kind of like in between the circulatory system and the musculature. And this plays more into the triple deity aspect that I talked about in my One Punch Man being Hellraiser video. That's where all of this stuff started, by the way, so check that video out in case you want even more backstory on this stuff. The triple deity also goes into one of the many aspects going into God, like I mentioned. He's not just based off of Osiris, but he's also based off of Ashra, Indra, and the Devas from Buddhist and Hinduism. The Ashra stuff is more so the triple deity thing because they are primarily associated with having three faces and multiple limbs. Aside from them, there's also aspects of Kaguya Hime from Tale of the Bamboo Cutter and God, as well as Leviathan from Hellraiser. But anyway, afterwards, God tells Homeless Emperor silence and then pretty much just kills him. But before this, Homeless Emperor first sees God in what could be considered maybe even a fourth form. Maybe this could be his true form, possibly, where it appears that he is crawling on top of the moon and then standing upright. Like I said, God is essentially Osiris, the god of the moon. Also, a fun little fact is that there is a crater on our own moon in real life, and it is named Osiris. However, the crater on the moon in the One Punch Man world was, of course, made from Boros kicking Saitama to it. It also created the aesthetic of an eyeball, which represents the eye of Horus, which I also talked about in my previous Saitama being Ra video. Please check that video out because there's a lot of stuff that I don't want to have to go over again in this video, but I'll just say there's the eye of Horus, there's the eye of Ra, and we see this symbology throughout the series multiple times, and we will continue to see it until it is over. It essentially tells us who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and kind of everything in between. But another thing that is linked to him is, like I said, these black mysterious cubes. Now, all that we really know about them is that there are multiple of them throughout the world, and it's also kind of implied that they are in space as well, since we see, like, an astronaut holding one on the cover of chapter 139. And if you touch one of these cubes, which are also incredibly heavy, you're able to communicate with God, and he basically says, if you are worthy, you will receive his power. If not, you will receive confiscation, which is just death, I guess. It's also revealed that Blast, the S-Class Rank 1 hero, is very interested in these cubes, and he's kind of going around and collecting them. God is also aware of Blast, and Blast is aware of God. We also see most recently that Blast is implied to have always been fighting against God and his implied forces throughout the universe, since we see him open a portal to what appears to be space or something. We don't really have too much information on this yet, but it appears that there are others like Blast out there that are fighting against God and his implied forces. But we can learn a lot more about this character and his motives and his origin through the mythology that he is based off of. 
and it's predominantly from the myth of Osiris. So let me go into that now and explain who Osiris is, as well as the portion of the story that one chose to implement into One Punch Man. So Osiris is the god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, and vegetation in ancient Egyptian religion. He was classically depicted as a green-skinned deity with a pharaoh's beard, partially mummy-wrapped at the legs, wearing a distinctive atif crown and holding a symbolic crook and flail. He is also the god of the moon. Plutarch recounts one version of the Osiris myth in which Set, Osiris' brother, along with the queen of Ethiopia, conspired with 72 accomplices to plot the assassination of Osiris. Set fooled Osiris into getting into a box, which Set then shut, sealed with lead, cut into pieces, and threw into the Nile. Osiris' wife Isis searched for his remains until she finally found him embedded in a tamarisk tree husk, which was holding up the roof of a palace in Byblos. She managed to remove the coffin and retrieved her husband's body. She made replicas of them and distributed them to several locations, which then became centers of Osiris's worship. So that right there, I think, told us everything that we need to know about what the possible origin of God is. But before I go into it, let me just say that I can't give you like the exact in-depth 100% explanation and backstory on God because there's just no way to know that because one isn't one for one adapting this lore. Same way that other manga because don't one for one adapt Tale of the Bamboo Cutter, but I can give you a rough idea. So I'm assuming that God was like a super powerful alien God, somewhere out in the universe, possibly in another dimension, not really sure about that yet, but it's possible that he had like a brother. And in the myth of Osiris, it says that Set was the one who tricked Osiris and cut him up into pieces. But in the One Punch Man story, Set is Genos. In another video, I'll explain all of that stuff, Genos being Set, Drive Knight being Horus, and how Metal Knight connects to the both of them. But this goes back to how there are many mythologies that make up this character. And in other iterations of even the myth of Osiris, his brother could be called Typhon. But going to a different mythology, like I said before, how there's the Ashra and Indra and Deva's influence on God. Well, the most prominent, I would say, is Indra. Also, the Roman equivalent of Indra is Jupiter. The aesthetic of God is referred to as Jupiter by Psychos, and I'm pretty sure that's where all of that's stuff comes from. Also, this isn't the first character that one has mixed Roman mythology with other mythologies. Child Emperor is another example of that, and yes, I'll talk about that in another video. But anyway, in Hinduism, Indra's brother is Shurya, who is the god of the sun. Just like how in Egyptian mythology, Ra is the god of the sun. We talked about how that is Saitama. So it's possible that if God did have a brother, it was possibly based off of Shurya. Because like I said, the story ultimately comes down to the sun versus the moon. But anyway, Anyway, God is, you know, not a good guy. And I guess he always was that way. And his other near omnipotent brother or near omnipotent peers, because, you know, as it says in Plutarch's version of the myth, there was 72 accomplices. So there could have been like a council of super powerful aliens out there that all conspired to take down God. And uh, however it went down, they tricked him to get inside of this like hyper cube. And I'm pretty sure that's why we see him in like the fetal position when Saitama, Flash, Flash, and Monaco are viewing him after touching the cube. That is like where God literally is right now. He's trapped inside of the original Tesseract or Hyper Cube or whatever they put him inside of. And then, you know, I'm sure you know where this is going. They cut the cube up into many pieces and threw it out into space. We actually see symbology for this in chapter 76 because after Sonic is given the monster cell to eat by Hellfire and Gale, he decides to cut it up and cook it first. We see the pieces going into the pan and ignited by the fire. This is representing the sun, of course, defeating the moon. Then once it is plated, we see the pieces chopped up as God was. We also see the moon symbology in the back along with vegetation and water. And while we're on symbology, let me just go back to the volume 23 table of contents, which I've talked about many times, but just in case you're unaware, if you look down below the monster association, we do see the cube placed on an arc with other Egyptian symbology present along, of course, with the eye of Horus. This is also a call back to the myth as pieces of Osiris were put into gold boxes like this for display. But these cubes basically went out to life bearing planets or 
planets with intelligent life. And one of them, of course, was Earth. And when it landed in Earth, I'm assuming it fell into a tree, as it says in Plutarch's version of the myth. But this also ties into Myth of the Bamboo Cutter, because like I said, there is part of Kaguya Hime in God as well, because at least in the version of the book that I have, it says that it's the ancestor of all romances. So I guess Japanese authors and mangas and whoever just think it's like a cool thing to implement it. I guess it's just a part of their culture or something. But in that story, Kaguya Hime comes down from the moon as like a thumb-sized glowing baby, and she winds up embedded inside of this glowing bamboo plant, and this dude finds her, and that's basically what we're getting here. Now, as for who found him on Earth, I'm assuming it was a woman. And this woman is representing Isis. Now, in One Punch Man, the story that we are following, Isis is Psychos. So this is essentially the first Psychos, or possibly the first Esper. And I'm assuming that this is how Espers came to be on Earth. It all descends from like one person or just one bloodline. Because I assume that the tree that God fell into or the portion of him or the cube that went in there sprouted like this special fruit. And this original Psycho slash Isis ate the fruit and became the first Esper. And then God basically used her as a vessel to spread his influence throughout the world, which goes into the part of the myth where it says she she made replicas of them and distributed them to several locations, which then became centers of Osiris's worship. This is why the ninja village looks like the cube, because the ninja village leader is a direct disciple of God. This is also why that Esper testing facility that had Tatsumaki captive is cube shaped as well. And this is also why when a Mai mask tells the history of the world to Saitama about there being many, many wars in the past that led to the world becoming the way that it is now, all of these wars were because of the influence of God. The cubes and whatnot were distributed to all of the leaders of the world, and he influenced them to cause war. Because these wars would give birth to more monsters. Because the more monsters that are created means that there's more of a possibility for Orochi to be born. He needs a being powerful enough as Orochi to be born so that he can be placed on the altar so that he can be released from the original Tesseract type prison that he was put in. And he will be reborn on Earth. And at that point I'm assuming he'll get his skin back as well which is probably green could be wrong about that but you know Osiris is depicted as being green we actually already kind of see hints of it in that colored spread that one in Murata gave us so now that I got that out of the way let me just show you how the series shows us that this is a pretty good possibility so in chapter 130 after Sairochi explains her ultimate goal to Tatsumaki which is essentially God's ultimate goal he's kind of speaking through her in this sequence but I'll go back to that. Tatsumaki says, using immense strength to devour everybody until you're alone in the universe just sounds moronic. And Sairochi, who remember is kind of God speaking through her in a way right now, says, you are the moron. This is the end point towards which all intelligent life has been headed since the beginning. And right here, we see what I was talking about. The Adam and Eve symbology, but it's more than that because this is probably how the One Punch Man world, the monster and espers all started. We see the tree and we see the god-like snake that is represented in Sairochi's bottom half, handing an apple to the woman who was likely the first Isis slash Psychos. And on the right we see the Adam type character and I'm thinking that he represents the first monster who is a byproduct of whatever the first Isis did to him, similar to how Psychos made Orochi. And it goes back to me saying that this was like the cycle that God always had in mind for his resurrection. But anyway, going further, Sairochi says, I am the chosen one for this task. You have outstanding psychic ability, yet it is I and not you. Why is that? You and your sister never considered the future that your abilities might create. Instead, you became ridiculous heroes and ignored my warning. Consider it divine punishment. So that right there, I, I think, is going back to why espers were made in the first place. God giving these humans certain abilities so that he can communicate with them or use them as conduits to do his bidding, which is ultimately creating a being strong enough to resurrect him to the earth. So like I said, in a way, all of the espers kind of come from like the same bloodline possibly, meaning that it's likely that in some way or another, Blast, Tatsumaki, Fubuki, Psychos, and whoever else is an Esper are kind of related. 
I mean, it's more so apparent between Blast, Tatsumaki, and Fubuki, but I'll talk about that in another video. Now, why I say it was a fruit, well, because, you know, we see the god snake handing the apple, you know, kind of like how the serpent did, but it goes back to the whole tree of life thing, which we also see Naruto use with Kaguya Hime's tree producing the fruit that led to the birth of Chakra. Pretty sure the same thing is going on here, because we also might actually see what the literal fruit looks like. Because in the mural that depicts the whole thing about place a worthy sacrifice on this altar, God shall be resurrected to this earth, we see humans giving all of the offerings that have the mark of Horus on them, but there's one individual thing that stands out from them that doesn't have the mark, and it's this interesting looking fruit right here. And if you look at what's sprouting out of the god snake portion of Sairochi, it's kind of like the same thing. And I think that's the symbology for the original fruit that was bared from God's arrival on Earth. So now that we got that out of the way, I guess we can go into what God's ultimate goal is after he is resurrected to the Earth. And I'm pretty sure it's explained to us in chapter 130 as well. This goes back to what I talked about in my previous video with Saitama being robbed, about how one like literally tells us the truth about the series, but kind of disguises it as normal dialogue. You know, we saw it back in chapter 86 with the whole limiter stuff. Well, I'm pretty sure we're seeing it again here. Because once Psychos is explaining how she received her new powers in Tatsumaki, after forcefully merging with Orochi, she says it resembled brain cells, visualizations of outer space, and the surface of Jupiter. It goes back to what I was saying with the whole Indra thing, Jupiter being the Roman god that is associated with Indra. I don't really think it goes any deeper than that, to be honest, but maybe it does. It was something like God, and as time stopped, its gaze fell upon me. In that moment, I awakened destiny. I would use this power to absorb all living creatures through these roots and fuse their spirits into a single entity. I will become the ultimate life form, the very planet itself. So yeah, that's what God wants. And I'm pretty sure it's because Earth is like the perfect planet to do this. I think God has reached many planets. Because like I talked about in the Saitama video, pretty sure Boros is a result of God's influence. And in Boros' backstory, it told us that his planet wasn't the most hospitable. So therefore, God isn't exactly going to take that one over. And I'm pretty sure that's also why one introduced aliens so early on in the series, to just establish that this is like a universal connection threat thing going on right here but also in the panel with isis taking the fruit from the god snake it said this is the end point towards which all intelligent life has been headed since the beginning and also goes back to how there are other blasts out there all fighting against god i'm pretty sure these are the other planets that were infected by his influence in a similar way him trying to get like an orochi type being to resurrect himself so that he could use the planet and all of the being itself to become all powerful and maybe take revenge on Shurya or Typhon or the other conspirators who took him down. The original Saitama, I guess you could say. And no, that doesn't mean that Saitama is like the reincarnation of Indra, the way that it works in Naruto. Like I said before, Saitama is just a regular guy who worked from nothing and became the one above all. And I think the Shurya or the Typhon or whoever the brother of God was might be the first person who removed his limiter or just showed that removing your limiter and working towards that is the proper way way to power the light side and God went into the dark side with all of his powers and that's why the exposition that we get on monsters about how it's an explosion of negativity born from like inferiority complexes and stuff like that that comes from God that's who he was as we're with Saitama his was obviously born on the opposite end of the spectrum. And I think once God saw that Shurya or Typhon used that type of power to become all powerful and overcame him, you know, stuffed him in that box and cut him up, threw him out into space, he made sure that all other intelligent life wouldn't be able to remove their limiter. That's why he put his system into play and made sure that all beings would partially be monsters or partially would be able to become monsters and put the limiter on them so that they could not remove their limiters. And in another video, I'll explain how God does this. It's actually explained to us in the very first episode, believe it or not. But Saitama was the one that I guess, statistically, it was inevitable that maybe somebody was gonna come along and do what Saitama did. But since Saitama has done it and removed his limiter, that's why God has no influence on him and why God can't really perceive Saitama because he's not a part of his system. So to finish this off, let me just show you a 
another example of one telling us this story. So some of you might be familiar with the one-shot manga Monster of Earth. This was like a collaborative effort between one who wrote this and the artists Murata and Nishimura Kinu. So the story in this one shot is similar to the story of One Punch Man. As to where there's like this older guy who's like defending Earth and he has like these special powers that allow him to grow big and fight against monsters. And we see his son, who is the MC, also 16 years old, kind of resents him for not being like the hero that he thinks that he should be. And the MC himself wants to be like a true hero. This is literally the same dynamic that we see between Blast and Blue, because that's where like the inspiration for those characters originally started. Even though they are also based off of Egyptian mythological figures, and I'll explain them in another video. But anyway, in the beginning of this chapter, we get some exposition and we're also seeing straight up the moon viewing the earth. Remember, moon, Osiris, God. And it says earth, a planet rich of resources and good and habitable environment. However, the civilization is still developing. There's a rising uproar to expand into galaxy. Even though their planet looks weak as a baby from orbit, Earth is a beautiful planet. There's no reason not to send monsters there. And then we see a monster attacking Earth. And then going further, we get more narration where it says, in the past, before Earth received the attention of monsters, an alien who lost his home world to war drifted to Earth. He adapted to the environment and culture of Earth and married an Earthling. Not long after, they gave birth to a child. Naturally, this is not a normal child. He inherited the alien's abilities, the ability to turn into a giant at will. And then we see like Black S in this chapter as well, but that's neither here nor there. Black S does actually represent a figure in Egyptian mythology as well, but I'll talk about that in another video. But anyway, can you kind of like figure out where I'm going here? It goes back to what I was talking about with, you know, God being defeated, chopped up in pieces, sent to earth influenced humans, made espers and monsters, and you get what I'm talking about. All right, so I'm gonna be continuing my series on the truth about One Punch Man in this video. So please check out the other videos I made so far because I'm going to be referencing them. The videos about Saitama being Ra and God being Osiris. So in this one, I'm gonna be talking about why people become monsters in One Punch Man, something that has confused a lot of us for a long time, or at least me, and we never really truly got the answer but just like I've been talking about in those previous videos, a lot of the answers to the mysteries of One Punch Man have kind of been in front of our faces the whole time, and this is no exception. It was actually revealed to us in the first episode slash second chapter. When Crab Lante is talking to Saitama, he says, I transformed into Crab Lante after eating too much crab. And that's it. That's why people become monsters. It's the food. It's the agriculture and the water supply that is contaminating humans that leads them to becoming monsters. So let me explain to you why that is. So going back to the God being Osiris stuff, it's stated that Osiris is the God of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, and vegetation in ancient Egyptian religion. So that right there is the big correlation between God being responsible for agriculture and water in general. And that is what leads to, as Dr. Gina says in chapter 86, cellular abnormalities and spontaneous mutation. And then going further into that exposition, he says, there are many cases of living things other than human beings turning into monsters due to environmental pollution and other triggers. So aside from that, just let me show you this smoking gun real quick, which is one like straight up telling us that this is the case. So in the redraw for chapter 115, when we see a Orochi looking at the sacrifice prophecy mural. We see like these hieroglyphics of these people giving their offerings to God. And then we see the prophesized Orochi, which is kind of just like the apex sacrificial monster, which will eventually lead to God's resurrection on earth. But if we look closely at this, we see them giving God livestock and water as well as like babies. And this isn't exclusively meant to represent. They are sacrificing these things to God. It's more so them giving God these things so that he can infect them, which leads to controlling the masses and turning them more into monsters so that eventually an Orochi can be born. Because if you look at the things that they're giving him, they are all marked with the spiral. And if you go down to the bottom of the mural, you'll see that the spiral is of course representing the Eye of Horus, talked about this many times, but it essentially leads to him being the mastermind behind all of this stuff. They're giving him these vases and these chalices, which I'm pretty sure are representing 
water or just liquid in general. We're also giving him land and sea animals, as well as like fruit and like I said, babies, which goes to show that there are definitely monsters that were like that since birth. This could explain what the subterraneans are in a way. But aside from that, this also gives more credence to why the sea folk are even a thing. Because going back to chapter 86's exposition, like I said, one of the most important chapters in the series, Dr. Gina says, they were natural creatures with an innate animosity towards humankind. Keep in mind that word natural, because one has used it many times, telling us the truth about the series, but disguising it as normal dialogue, hiding in plain sight. He does that a lot. Because the other natural thing is evil natural water. That is like the truth of things. I mean, of course, it was always like a meme and we always laughed at it because it is kind of funny because that also plays into one's writing style, but it's telling us that the water is evil and it is natural because it has kind of always been that way because of God's influence on it. It's also why Psychos, AKA Isis, was able to experiment on it and make it become a monster and why, of course, it bears the eye of Horus. Also, if we go to chapter 85, we see the whole iconic Dine and Dash chapter with Garo going into that diner, eating a whole bunch of food and then dashing out. This isn't just necessarily like a meme sequence or whatever, or just showing Garo recovering. It's also kind of explaining explaining how this system works, which also plays more into Garo's struggle between humanity and becoming a monster. We see him like devouring all of this food, especially this huge steak. The steak is the most prominent. And then after he eats it, he washes it down with a huge mug of water. And also while we're on the topic of characters eating, if we go to chapter 86, the hot pot chapter, the meat is singled out in this sequence as well. And it leads to another ha ha funny sequence with Geno saying, what are you doing with master's meat, Fubuki? But it's more so representing that the meat is basically poison. And speaking of master's meat, you can do this research yourself because if you go through the series, you will see that Saitama, who is, like I said, Ra, never willingly eats meat or obtains it himself. It's always vegetables and stuff or other monsters that you see him eat, but he never by himself is able to get meat. Obviously there's many factors and variables that go into it and there's a lot of supplementary scenes in the anime, not so much in the manga, but if Saitama ever obtains meat, it is because someone else gave it to him. And this of course represents the offerings to Ra, which is a big part of the mythology. Even when Saitama is explaining how he removed his limiter to Carnage Kabuto, aka Kepri, he says also eat three meals a day. Even just a banana will do for breakfast. Now let's go to the web comic with chapter 119, another super important chapter. As I've talked about this many times, my mask explains the history of the One Punch Man world to Saitama, and he says a long time ago, Earth had many nations. They fought against each other for land and resources through countless world wars. Population decreased until humans began prioritizing the preservation of future generations, unified the languages and established a world government this was the first era of change. So all of these wars were large in part because of God's influence. And this of course goes back to the myth of Osiris and how Osiris's body parts were replicated and passed around the world, or at least Egypt. But like I also said, one's character God here is not just singularly Osiris. He is an collection of many deity-like characters. And one of them, like I've said in multiple videos, is Leviathan, the Lord of the Labyrinth. And part of Leviathan's backstory says that he descended to man in his dreams, whispering to him the keys of logic in the secret language of science that could only describe the vision that burned in his mind, of tolls of machines, of weapons of all things glorious and magnificent. Leviathan showed man how to use these against the world, that he may bring all life around him to its knees, bend to his will and destroy all that stood in his way. No sooner had he risen from the mud, he reached for his first weapon and laying waste to everything around him, slaughtering his enemies, stealing their skins as no creature ever had. To drape over his own, the world began to bleed, growing only more silent and more still, withering, waning, dying. And silence is a key word here because Osiris is the Lord of Silence. And I'm sure that might have triggered something in your mind because that's what he says to Homeless Emperor right before he drains him. But if we go back to the Dine and Dash in chapter 85, before Garo enters the diner, he like intimidates this random thug guy and he says, I'm different from them. I can even scare these scumbags into silence. But anyway, going back to chapter 119 of the webcomic with the history of the world, my mask continues saying, still the aftermath 
aftermath of the world wars continue to erode the earth, increase in environmental toxicity, rapid climate change, and rise in sea level, gave birth to large number of harmful life forms, forcing humanity to abandon much of the landmass, migrating and reestablishing themselves in the middle of the supercontinent. After the second era of change, the only remaining nation once again began to prosper. And then going further, he also says humans are also called constant environmental beings meaning we are special species that can even control the environment. And then right here we see Adam and Eve symbology, and I talked about this in my previous God video, about how we also see that in chapter 130, but also the Tree of Life, about how that's explaining how all of this stuff started. It's not a coincidence, it's all coming from one. It's all kind of telling us the same story. And also all the population coming together and migrating to this supercontinent is obviously a great way to have everybody all consuming the same food supply and the same water supply so that he can continue this inherent slow monsterification of all humans. And this is also why monster cells need to be eaten in order for you to become a monster, more one telling us what the actual truth is. Okay, so in this one, I'm gonna be continuing my series on the truth about One Punch Man, so please watch the other three videos that I've made so far. They'll give you way more insight into what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. But when I was making my latest video about why people become monsters in One Punch Man, I reread chapter 119 of the webcomic because of the exposition that my mass gives about the history of the One Punch Man world. But little did I know, the actual most important part of this chapter is in the cold open. Something that I, and I'm sure many others thought was just like a funny little throwaway scene, but it's actually one telling us the truth about the story, but hiding it in plain sight. And if you've watched my other videos, you know that I've been saying this a lot. This is something that one does all the time. He's been doing it since the beginning of the series and he continues to do it now. But, but this is like the most blatant example I found of it so far and the most clever at the same time. So in the beginning of this chapter, Saitama randomly runs into this guy Ragnar who says he's going to use the power of the blood dragon. But then after defeating him, he runs into these knight looking dudes and they say, oh my god, you actually defeated one of the nine warriors of the dragon alliance? The seal stone won't be taken all thanks to you. The cruel dragon seal has been protected by the action of Saitama. And then Saitama just, you know, writes this off, you know, modestly and nonchalantly. He's like, uh, no, I, I just came here because I heard about a robbery, which is basically what's going on in like the overall story. Like Saitama doesn't actively know that he's taking down God and saving the world as a result. But going further, the knight is like, you did more than that. You saved the world. Even though this is a secret mission, it should be fine explaining the situation to our savior. So keep in mind, secret mission. As I said, what's going to be explained here is what's actually going on in the story with God and not only him, but Blast and the monsters. And this secret mission is also why Blast's mission is always regarded as confidential or secret or why he never really gives anyone insight into it. Even when Blast explains what he's doing to Saitama and Flashy Flash, he's very vague about it and says he just goes around and collecting these cubes. Obviously, Blast has way more insight into what's truly going on, but he can't tell outsiders, as we'll come to find out. But anyway, going further, the knight says, according to legend, a colossal dragon descended upon Earth and became the embodiment of destruction. It just took a few days and it took countless lives and scorch large swaths of land. This is of course talking about God, aka Osiris, coming to Earth, and him scorching large swaths of land is a metaphor for what he actually did with destroying the environment through his pollution and influence on mankind, with them becoming monsters, polluting the agriculture and the water, and forcing them into these wars. And like I said, we talked about this in my previous videos, so again, please check them out in case you're confused. But here's where it gets super interesting, because going further, he says, ancient soldiers, gathered together with a great many sacrifices, managed to weaken the cruel dragon. Seal Master separated the essence of the dragon using nine seal stones and sealed them in nine temples scattered across the land. So what do we see here? The cube. Now, the cubes aren't really an aspect of the webcomic continuity, at least yet. But obviously, they are a big part of the manga's continuity, and this chapter came out before that stuff was revealed in the manga. But this goes to show us that the myth of Osiris is indeed an integral part of this portion of the story. Because as we talked about before, Osiris was tricked by Set and put into a box, then cut up into pieces, and then thrown into the Nile. And I speculated that's pretty much what was going on with God.
God. He either had a brother of equal power or there was like a council of aliens or something that came together and were able to put God into these cubes somehow and then threw them out into space. And then eventually God made his way to Earth. And it turns out that that's pretty much the case. Now, as for them being nine, I don't know if that's like the literal number because the story that's being told here is not the literal story, but it's more so just a rough retelling of what's actually going on. So the number could be more than that, but them being scattered to multiple temples is actually what we see going on in the main story as well. Remember how I talked about before, the main places where Blast shows up all resemble cubes. The Ninja Village, the Esper testing facility that he saved Hatsumaki from, those places had cubes, or at least was heavily implied to have one. And then of course, one of the other temples that housed these cubes was the Monster Association itself. You know, for sure, the Esper testing facility had a cube in it because when Blast showed up there, the Save Tatsumaki, he had the cube in his hand. But as for the ninja village, I talked about how the ninja leader very likely made a deal with God and became one of his main disciples, which gave him access to the abilities that he has. That also gives an explanation as to why Blast showed up there in Sonic's flashback and why he just had a beef with the ninja leader in the first place. There was a cube there and he was going after it. But going further into this exposition will make more sense of that. So he further says the duty of watching over the cruel dragon seals was passed down onto our branch known as saints. Those who believe themselves to be dragonborn and are plotting to resurrect the cruel dragon belong to an organization known as Deathbone. So this is it right here. This is Blast and his group versus God's disciples. So going further into this, I'm pretty sure the saints are representing, like I said, Blast and those other Blast type beings that we saw him go to when he said he wasn't fighting alone out there. These are all the good guys trying to get the cubes and protect them so that the other side can't. And then as for the other side, the Death Bone, pretty sure they represent like the Ninja Leader, whoever was in control of the Esper Testing Facility, Psychos and the Monster Association, Drive Knight and the Organization. I mean, the Organization is even name dropped here. Fuzzy controlling the Neo Heroes. And then I'm pretty sure the Samurai who has the Moon Blade is a part of this. And then I'm sure there's like other characters that we're not even really aware of yet. Going further, he says, this conflict surrounding the Cruel Dragon Seals has continued for 800 years. Now, now that's another number that I think isn't exactly accurate because we know this goes back to Egyptian times and we don't have the exact timeline of the world in One Punch Man, but I'm assuming it goes back thousands and thousands of years, especially since we see a lot of Adam and Eve iconography within this story being told in both the webcomic and the manga. So continuing, he says, Deathbone has amped up their activities to take advantage of the frequent monster incidents as of late, and we have been on high alert guarding the seal stone. So this is of course an analog to what's going on with the Monster Association and that whole arc. But anyway, one of these Deathbone members is there as well, and he starts talking to Saitama, and he says, regardless, the day will eventually come. We will take all the seal stones, and Lord Cruel Dragon will be resurrected. And then Saitama asks him, so when is this eventually? And then the Deathbone member's like, I don't know, 10 years, uh, maybe 100? It's actually six months because of Shibawa's prophecy. Then he also says, Lord Cruel Dragon has been quietly waiting for the seals to become weaker. In the off chance death bone is wiped out, those who inherit our will shall appear and realize the resurrection. Now that's super important there because he's saying like if they're all wiped out, like if the ninja leader, the organization, and Drive Knight, you know, whoever else, if they're all gone, there will eventually be born someone who will realize this, such as like a monster, because there will always be monsters born as long as God has his influence over like the agriculture, as well as the actions of men who are susceptible to his influence. But we also saw in chapter 115, once Orochi finally came to like his potential of power, it said he instinctually went to the core of the earth to drain it of its power. Going there, he was able to find the mural, which foretold of the resurrection of God, although Orochi mistakenly thought it was his own resurrection. And that comes into the differences between the web comic continuity and the manga continuity. Obviously, we don't know everything about the cubes in the manga yet, and there hasn't been anything said about the cubes coming together to resurrect God, it was more so stated that if a worthy sacrifice is placed on an altar, i.e. Orochi, then God would be resurrected to the earth. But anyway, Saitama's like, if it's going to resurrect at some point, why not now? <laughs> then we literally see Saitama speedrun collecting the cubes while carrying the Deathbone member, while also defeating the nine dragon warriors. But the last one that he runs into says, a new hero hired on by saints leaking our secret to outsiders is forbidden. And they even broke that do they have no self-esteem going back to what I was talking about with blasts not really telling anyone what's going on? 
on and why his mission is considered confidential. After Saitama defeats this guy, he gets the last cube and we see the location that they're at has like these hieroglyphics on it, similar to the hieroglyphics that we see in chapter 115 on the mural foretelling God's resurrection. But then Saitama gets all of the cubes together and resurrects the cruel dragon. And then the dragon's like, the hatred I have accumulated over the years will be repaid with the lies of humanity. And then when we get a close up on the dragon, his eyes look like moons, which is of course a callback to Osiris, AKA God. And as he shoots like a beam at Saitama, similar to the power set of God or in the implied so one, Saitama defeats him with one punch. And this goes back to what I talked about in my previous videos with when it eventually comes down to Saitama facing God like 1v1 in a physical fight, it will be decided with one strike from Saitama. This is also shown to us again at another chapter in the manga, but I'll talk about that in another video. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. All right, so we're gonna be continuing my truth about One Punch Man series. And today we're gonna be talking about Blast, the number one S-class hero. I'm also gonna be talking about a lot of stuff that I already went over in my previous videos in this series. So please check out the playlist that I have in case you need to be caught up on all of this stuff or you just need a refresher. But aside from us knowing that Blast is the number one S-class hero, we also know that he's really interested in the cubes that are connected to God. So far in the series, we've seen both past and present. He's gone around collecting these cubes. And on the surface, his motives have stayed pretty ambiguous. But if you've been following these videos, you'll know that we pretty much know what's going on with them. So let me get into the Egyptian mythological figure that Blast is based off of, and that is Ta. So Ta is an ancient Egyptian deity, a creator god, and patron of craftsmen and architects. In the triad of Memphis, this, he is the husband of Sekhmet and the father of Nefertim. He is also regarded as the father of the sage Emotep. So let's break down those three names there. So Sekhmet represents Fubuki, Nefertim represents Blue, and I'm pretty sure Emotep represents Sitch. Now as for Sekhmet being Fubuki, I'm going to be talking about that in another video dedicated to her. But obviously Blast isn't the husband of Fubuki in One Punch Man, but I think this more so represents that they are related. And I'm sure many of us have speculated that it's likely that Blast is related to Tatsumaki and Fubuki in some way. But going off of this and the history of the One Punch Man world that is presented to us, it seems that he is their father. So what really makes me think that is that their ages kind of line up. Blast's implied age is to be like, I don't know, in his 50s or something. So that would make sense that he'd be the father of a 28 and 23 year old. And then of course also they're all espers or at least Blast is implied to be an esper or it's said by miss f who is fubuki in the one punch man encyclopedia that blast is straight up an esper and also when blast saves tatsumaki from that testing facility he somehow knows that she has a sister now either blast is like reading tatsumaki's mind by putting his hand on her head or he simply always knew because they're his daughters and also we never know who the true parents of tatsumaki and fubuki are we just know right off the bat that they were given to a foster family and then their foster family sold them off to the cube testing facility. So it just makes sense to me that Blast is their father and he put them up for adoption because, you know, he's Blast and he has to do the cube stuff, which we'll get into. And while we don't know Blast's official color scheme yet, I'm pretty sure his hair is going to be revealed to be blue because Ta's head is blue and that could explain why Tatsumaki's hair is green and why Fubuki's hair is like black and green or whatever it is. Maybe their mother had blonde hair or something. So as for Nefertim, this is blue. So the little information that we have on him says that Nefertim was eventually seen as the son of the creator god Ta, and the goddesses Sekhmet and Bast, who are Fubuki and Tatsumaki, were sometimes called his mother. In art, Nefertim is usually depicted as a beautiful young man having blue water lily flowers around his head. And as for Emotep, like I said, I'm pretty sure this is Sitch. So it says Emotep was an Egyptian counselor to Pharaoh Djoser. I'm pretty sure Djoser is Agoni and possible architect of Djoser Steppe Pyramid and the high priest of the sun god Ra at Heliopolis. So we all know that Ra is Saitama by now and Heliopolis is 
is the Hero Association. And the main reasoning for Emotep being Sitch, because he is the one directly in the Hero Association who talks about Blast and is name dropped by Blast. Because when Blast is leaving with Saitama and Flashy Flash, he says, hey, say hi to Sitch and Tatsumaki for me. And of course, him being a high priest to Rod Heliopolis, which is the Hero Association as we establish. And this means the City of the Sun. Sun, Ra, Saitama. And it was principally noted as the cult center of the sun god Atum, who is king, who came to be identified with Ra. And this is why Saitama lives at the Hero Association currently, because it's this. But anyway, let's go back to Ta, because he is generally represented in the guise of a man with green skin, contained in a shroud, sticking to the skin, wearing a divine beard and holding a scepter containing three powerful symbols of the ancient Egyptian religion. Power, life, and stability. His form is found contained in its white shroud, wearing the Atef crown, an attribute of Osiris, who we've established is God. Gradually, he formed with Osiris a new deity called Ta Sokar Osiris. So this means a few things, in my opinion. First of all, of course, we've seen that God takes the form of Blast, and when he's, like, exposed, he looks like a fusion of God and Blast. But also, I'm pretty sure this means that the black hole singularity abilities that we see coming from Blast are also coming from God. Now, we don't know how he did this yet. But in my opinion, he somehow reverse engineered the cube, or just the abilities that God can give to you. Because also, God knows Blast's name. When we first see Saitama and Flashy Flash make contact with God after Blast shows up, God's like, is that Blast? So they definitely have a history. So I don't know if Blast, like, made a deal with God originally, and then he somehow tricked him, and then retained the powers, but didn't have to become reliant on him, or have that linked as to where he can receive confiscation, or Blast using his inherent Esper power somehow reverse engineered the cube that way and then siphoned its power and made himself stronger. Now another thing about Ta is that he's an Egyptian creator god who conceived the world and brought it into being through the creative power of speech. Him of Ta says that Ta created the world in the design of his heart and that he gave life to all the gods through his heart and his tongue. So all the other gods are the heroes of course. Course. And I think this means that since we know that Blast is like the first shown person to be a hero in the series, because when we first see him in the flashback, he says like, you know, I'm a hero, although that's more of a hobby, I do have a proper job. And I think that when the Hero Association came together after it was formed by Agoni, witnessing the events of Saitama K. Ra, I guess Sitch came on board at first as well, but Sitch new blast or something i don't know we're just gonna have to really speculate a lot about this because there's little information to go off of in the story and also the egyptian literature but i assume that the way that the hero association works and the formation of the heroes and all that stuff is large in part because of blasts input and this also goes into the cult of ta now i think this means multiple things because the cult of ta could either just be the hero association itself but it could also be this league of blasts that we see in space or wherever they are after Blast reveals that he's not fighting alone out there. And this was also secretly revealed to us by one in chapter 119 of the webcomic. I talked about this in my previous video, but it basically says that after the cruel dragon came to Earth, aka Osiris, God, ancient soldiers gathered together and with a great many sacrifices managed to weaken the cruel dragon. Seal Master separated the essence of the dragon using the nine seal stones and sealed them in the temples scattered across the land. So this of course parallels the original Osiris myth, which one is choosing to use the version that says that Osiris's brother Set conspired with many accomplices and tricked Osiris to get into a box, which he cut up into pieces and threw into the Nile. And this is basically what's happening in the One Punch Man continuity. That's why we see God in that fetal position, because that was like the hypercube or whatever he was put inside of by these seal masters, and then it was cut into pieces. And that's why there's multiple cubes out there. But going further, it says the duty of watching over the cruel dragon seal was passed down to our branch known as Saints. These Saints, like I talked about before, I'm pretty sure are Blast and his Green Lantern core that we see. And this is, of course, the reason why he is always going after the cubes. And just to finish this off, let me just put it out there that Blast is a good guy. I mean, if we already haven't established that enough by now. But going back into the Egyptian stuff, it says that Ta could correspond with the sun deities Ra and Atem during the 
Armana period, where he embodied the divine essence of which the sun god was fed to come into existence. So yeah, Ra is Saitama, Blast is not a bad guy. But yeah, that's all of the insight that we're really going to be able to get into Blast at this point, because Todd himself is kind of ambiguous just the way that Blast is. We know more than we did originally, I guess, but we're just going to have to wait because one has carefully crafted this character to stay mysterious. But yeah, if you like the video, guys, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so today we're going to be continuing my series on the truth about One Punch Man. And in this one, we're going to be talking about Genos and Drive Knight and how one based these characters off of Egyptian gods and how their mythology can show us the truth about them as well as where their story could be headed. Also, please check out the playlist I have on this series as those videos can help you get better acquainted with what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. I'll have the link in the description. Okay, so in the first part of this video, I wanna go over the mythology aspects of Genos and Drive Knight. And in the second part, I'm gonna go in depth into why Drive Knight has actually been the mad cyborg this whole time. So Genos and Drive Knight are based off of Set and Horus, and their storyline in One Punch Man is based off of the contendings of Set and Horus, which is one of the key stories in the myth of Osiris, and if you've been following my videos so far, you'll know that the myth of Osiris is a big element of One Punch Man. So let's start with Genos and Set. Set is the god of deserts, storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners in ancient Egyptian religion. Set had a positive role where he accompanies Ra on his bark to repel Apep, the Serpent of Chaos. Now, as I've established before, Saitama is Ra. So this is why he has his relationship with Genos. It's the same as Ra and Set, as Set is known as the protector of Ra. Now, as for Apep, I've also said this before, he is Orochi. And I want to talk about Apep and Isis, who Psychos is based off of, in another video. Real quick, let's just go into some Set, Ra, and Apep lore. Ra was a assisted by a number of defenders who traveled with him, including Set. This is Saitama, along with the S-Class heroes and Genos. Apep's movements were thought to cause earthquakes, and when Saitama is fighting Orochi, it causes earthquakes. And Apep's battles with Set may have been meant to explain the origin of thunderstorms. When Genos is battling Sairochi, the name of the attack he uses is called Piercing Lightning Cannon. And when Genos and Sairochi's beams collided, it creates a storm-like explosion producing lightning. Now, in the original myth of Osiris, Set is the brother of Osiris, who in One Punch Man is God, and he betrays Osiris, leading to his dismemberment. But as I've stated before, one is not directly adapting the source material here. He is only using bits and pieces of the myth and adapting it as he sees fit, such as many mangakas do with their own series. One is more so just taking the Set versus Horus rivalry aspect, more so than just Egyptian gods and their literal family ties. As we've established before, he's more so going off of the lore of Osiris having many conspirators who came together, put him into a box, and then cut it up, threw it into the Nile. But speaking of Horus, let's go into him because he represents Drive Knight. So Horus is one of the most significant ancient Egyptian deities who served many functions, most notably the god of kingship and the sky. Different forms of Horus are recorded in history, and these are treated as distinct gods by Egyptologists. These various forms may possibly be different manifestations of the same multi-layered deity. This is, of course, why Drive Knight has many forms that we've seen throughout the series. The most commonly encountered family relationship describes Horus as the son of Isis and Osiris, and he plays a key role in the Osiris myth as Osiris's heir and the rival to Set. So as we We've gone over, Isis is Psychos, and Osiris is God. So I think him being referred to as Osiris' son means that Drive Knight is a byproduct of God. Not so much that he was literally created by him, but he is evil because of his influence. So if we go back to Genos' exposition on the Mad Cyborg in Chapter 7, he says one day a crazy cyborg went out of control and attacked our town, a runaway cyborg. I suppose a failure in his body modification generated an irregularity in his brain. Think that when Drive Knight was being made into a cyborg, he was visited by God in a similar manner to Psycho when she merged with Orochi, or when God tried to trick Tatsumaki by disguising himself as Blast. It's also implied he did the same thing to Amai Mask in the past. It was God and Drive Knight's willingness to accept his influence that allowed him to become the Mad Cyborg. This also further gives God
God, one of his greatest disciples, and paths to achieving his goal? With Psychos, he influenced her to create the Monster Association and take over the world with monsters, and also by turning more people into them. But with Drive Knight, he influenced him to make the organization and take over the world with machines and turn people into cyborgs. But I'll go more into all the organization stuff later on. But let's get back to the mythology. The Eye of Horus is an ancient Egyptian symbol of protection and royal power from deities, in this case from Horus or Ra. The symbol is seen on images of Horus's mother Isis and on other deities associated with her. So the Eye of Horus is an extremely important aspect of One Punch Man, just like we talked about before with the Eye of Ra. This is why Drive Knight has a singular eye. It represents the Eye of Horus. As it is also mentioned, the symbol is seen on images of Isis. This is represented when Psychos acted as Giro Giro. We'll also come to find out that the Eye of Horus is also represented as satellite's abilities to observe, as well as the organization's multiple technologies, but we'll talk about that later too. So now let's go into the Set and Horus rivalry. Now this story as a whole is very tricky and problematic. There's a large portion of it that involves uh, assault of a kind that I can't really talk about on YouTube, but I suppose one could be navigating that portion of the story with Drive Knight and Genos fusing together that one time when they fought against Orochi. But basically throughout the story, Horus and Set have various competitions to see who will be king. Horus beats Set each time. The beginning of the story is sort of a trial when both Set and Horus plead their cases and the deities of the Enneads state their opinion. One of these competitions is a race, and we actually see, or should I say hear one do this, in the Maji Drama CD Volume 3, where in a parallel universe the S-Class heroes are high school students participating in a relay race, and it eventually comes to Genos racing against Drive Knight, which leads to Drive Knight blowing Genos up with missiles. And the race is pretty much the most tame thing that Set and Horus do, or that I could talk about on YouTube. Feel free to look up the contendings of Set and Horus yourself if you want to read some pretty wild stuff. But like I said, one is more so adapting the rivalry of these two in general. Metal Knight is also a part of the contendings of Set and Horus, such as he is a major part of the Genos and Drive Knight story. But I need a full video dedicated to him, so I'll discuss Metal Knight and his Egyptian counterpart as well as his role in the next video. Anyway, later in the story, Set fights with Horus, and after several long battles, Horus finally wins and becomes king. So does this mean that Drive Knight is going to kill Genos and take over the world? I don't know one would necessarily go down that path entirely, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is a portion of the story where it appears that Drive Knight has won, only for Genos to come back and take him out. Okay, so now we've established all the mythology around these two, so now I want to go into the One Punch Man story itself and show the evidence supporting Drive Knight being the Mad Cyborg, and what his and the organization's ultimate goal is. But so this all starts in the first meeting between Genos and Drive Knight in Chapter 34, when Drive Drive Knight tells him Metal Knight is your enemy. Now like many of you at first I assumed Drive Knight was telling the truth. I mean why shouldn't we believe him? Especially this early on in the series when our only real glimpse of Metal Knight was him being suspicious in his lukewarm attempt to stop the meteor. However as we'll learn this is what Drive Knight does. He gaslights and manipulates and his main target of blame is Metal Knight, Dr. Bafoy. Likely because Bafoy is the one who created Drive Knight but we'll get into that later. Now let's fast forward to chapter 66 when Drive Knight shows up again. He comes across some Monster Association fodder and interrogates one of them for information about the Monster Association. Going to chapter 77, we'll find out that Drive Knight relayed this information he received from the monster to the Hero Association, such as their group name and their base location in Z City. Drive Knight did this for two reasons. First of all, for his own personal gain, of course, by collecting data on the Monster Association, but also staying in the good graces of the Hero Hero Association, because taking control of them is one of his ultimate goals. This also goes back to the Egyptian mythology of Heliopolis, we talked about this in the previous video. It's originally a place of worship for Ra, Saitama, but it later becomes a place of worship for Horus, Drive Knight. Cut to chapter 83, and Secondgar tells the S-Class heroes that Drive Knight insisted on running recon, ignored their warnings, and plunged into the ghost town by himself, and that last night, the signal from his transmitter ceased 
and that it would later appear that Drive Knight has fallen. In the following Chapter 84, we see a robot named Machine God G5 randomly show up to the Monster Association, saying that he spotted Narinki's private squad on his way and captured them for Giro Giro. He also says that the organization dispatched him to assist with the Monster Association. Then Psychos asks him how he found their hideout, and if she can speak with his maker. G5 responds in silence. So in my opinion, Drive Knight is the one who gave him the location of the base, and is also his maker. As we just went over, he obtained this information himself, and in the previous chapter, Drive Knight randomly goes silent. I don't think these two events are a coincidence, especially since G5 goes silent when he's asked how he obtained their location. Also, he has a singular eye, just like Drive Knight, which goes back to the eye of Horus. Whenever we see a singular eye in the series, it is one telling us that it's likely a bad guy. This also means that Drive Knight is likely the leader of the organization. Going further to Chapter 87, we see G5 collecting the broken Metal Knight robot head. Previously, when Metal Knight was battling Elder Centipede, he latched onto him, following him into the Monster Association, where he's eventually wrecked by Orochi. Royal Ripper asks G5 what he's doing with it, and he responds that he claimed it for his own personal interest, and that he plans to dissemble it, examine it, and that it's a valuable sample. Now we see the core reason of why Drive Knight sent G5 to the Monster Association. It was to retrieve Metal Knight's drone. Collecting data on the monsters was only secondary. Later in Chapter 95, we see G5 successfully retrieved and compiled all the pieces of the broken Metal Knight drone, which is discovered by Child Emperor. Child Emperor is able to access the drone's data, meaning that G5 surely has done the same, which means the organization now has crucial data for Metal Knight, which will lead to future elements of the story that we'll discuss later. Now let's fast forward to Chapter 117, where Drive Knight successfully defeated defeats Neon. He begins to talk to Segengar, who asks him what he's been doing since he's been radio silent for two days. Drive Knight says that he was gathering information on the enemy, and that he was able to gather the names, characteristics, and fighting styles of the members of the Monster Association, who are demon and dragon level. He implies he gained this information by further torturing monsters, but we never see him do any of this, so I believe that he gained this information from G5, who we saw was actually inside of the Monster Association. He then tells Segengar that he wanted to send the Hero Association this information, but he didn't want to run the risk of it being intercepted by a traitor. He then asks Segengar how strong the Hero's forces are at the moment, realizing that the strike team is busy with the Monster Association raid, and that Garo had taken down many heroes already. He then says that the Hero Association doesn't have many strong heroes for addressing a further crisis, and Segengar tells him that if an attack were to happen, then Metal Knight's defense system would activate, and Drive Knight says, and yet he made it. The moment you believed him, the battle was half over. He then goes on to tell Segengar that Metal Knight is the traitor and claims the monsters have hacked the robot's information and gained command of his weapons. He also claims that the passcodes for Bafoy's missiles and explosives may be in the monsters' hands as well. He also claims that he gave this information to the monsters on purpose as he plans to give weapons to the monsters because he's been waiting for a moment when the Euro Association is weak and he suspects that he wants to increase his personal military strength in order to dig over the world. This is all clearly nonsense, since we literally never see any of this remotely transpire. Obviously, before he didn't plan this, and obviously Psychos and the Monster Association didn't care about the drone at all. The only one who showed interest in it was G5, who is Drive Knight's pawn. In Chapter 100, we do see Zombie Man defeat some robots that appear to be a hybrid of monster and Metal Knight technology. Pretty evident that G5 was the one who created these, obviously to further incriminate Metal Knight, but also increasing his good graces with the Monster Association. This is further gaslighting from Drive Knight, as he is literally projecting his own machinations onto Metal Knight here. This is the true goal of the organization. Segengar then wisely says, no wait, we mustn't jump to conclusions. After all, you don't have proof. Drive Knight is silent because he's obviously lying. He then tries to deflect the conversation and asks him if the headquarters were to fall under attack, would Blast come to defend it? Segengar says he doubts it since he's practically retired. Then Segengar attempts to contact the HQ, telling them to go on high alert until conveniently G5 appears and shoots the phone and his hand off. 
This pretty much proves the connection here, and that Drive Knight has been probing Sengar for information as he felt this may have been a prime opportunity for the organization to make their attack on the Hero Association. Sengar then asks Drive Knight to defeat G5, but he says his equipment is barely operable as he was using it continuously for days and his battle with Neon has depleted his power for combat. While this is true, because we see him replenish his energy in Chapter 133, I believe this is a misdirect and just an excuse for him to not take out his own pawn. As G5 is about to attack Second Guard, Geno shows up at the last second and destroys him, leading us back to the Set and Horus rivalry, as Geno thwarts Drive Knight's plans, at least for now, and also in the mythology, Set eventually takes one of Horus' eyes. As we've established, G5 being one of Drive Knight's pawns, is also one of his eyes. In the following chapter 118, Drive Knight tells Genos that he's going to study Neon's anatomy for creating a biomatic weapon. This is important because it will be revealed as one of the organization's key strategies later on. Going forward to chapter 132, we see Drive Knight show up again during the battle against Sairochi. He immediately makes it clear that his only intention is to obtain a sample of Orochi. Later in the fight, he convinces Genos to combine with him so he can use the power from his core. After they work together fighting off Sairochi, he successfully obtains a piece of Orochi and then literally pieces out of there, leaving Genos to overheat and eventually die if Fubuki didn't save him. This further shows the evil self-serving side of Drive Knight, but the important thing here is him obtaining a piece of Orochi. This goes back to Drive Knight being a product of God. Horus being the son of Osiris. I believe Drive Knight will eventually bring Orochi back as a cyborg, and when he does this, he will also be bringing God back to the Earth. It was revealed in Chapter 115 that there is a sacrificial altar beneath the Monster Association with a mural depicting that an Orochi-like being will eventually be born, and when he is placed on the altar, he will resurrect God to the Earth. But as we saw, Orochi was killed by Tatsumaki and in the process burying the altar. This is where Drive Knight's resurrected Orochi cyborg comes into play. Just like how the original Orochi instinctually went to the core of the earth in search of energy to absorb, but in turn found the altar, the cyborg Orochi will likely do the same or something like that and will eventually be placed on the altar resurrecting God. This is why Drive Knight was originally interested in collecting the Orochi sample in the first place. It was God's influence the whole time. However, I don't think Drive Knight willingly knows that he is serving God prior Probably, he's more so subconsciously being manipulated. This is also why Drive Knight's box looks similar to the God Cubes. It's not a coincidence, the same way it's not a coincidence the Ninja Village and the Esper testing facilities are cubes. So now at this point, we're going to be leaving the manga's continuity and going into the webcomic. What we're going over is going to be happening much later in the story, and while the webcomic has different continuity than the manga, the arcs and future arcs will essentially be the same. Going to chapter 125, we find out that a rival hero organization has emerged, the Neo Heroes, and within their ranks, to assure their team works properly, they've hired two security guards in charge of cracking down on rule violators. Their names are Eremin and Destro. It's then revealed that they are both 94 and 95% cyborg. I'll cut to the chase with these two because I believe they are the original organization cyborgs we're introduced to in chapter 14 who attempt to kill Hammerhead, the brain robot and the gray fox looking robot but in disguise. I believe this means the organization has fully infiltrated the Neo Heroes and is secretly pulling a lot of its strings. Going further to chapter 131, Aramin and Destro reveal to Metal Bat that they've turned seemingly killed members of the Neo Heroes into cyborgs through a process of cyborgification, saying that if the brain is safe, it can be restored by taking full advantage of the cyber tech that scientists of the Neo Heroes have been studying for several years. In my opinion, this is the process that gave birth to Drive Knight, going back to the mad cyborg lore of his body modification causing an irregularity in his brain. Later, Eremin and Destro forcibly try to turn Metal Bat into a cyborg, but ultimately fail when the Neo Heroes leader Fuzzy shows up and stops them. This shows their 
true evil intentions. We also see all the Neo heroes wearing battle suits. Child Emperor says that unlike regular armor, it reads the wearer's nerves and use electrical signals to react with artificial muscles and sing, and that he saw plans for something like them in Metal Knight's development room. He then suspects that Metal Knight is involved and says that if it's true, then he effectively has both of the association's military mites in his grasp. This is of course a further misdirect. As we know by now, Drive Knight is the true perpetrator here. We further see one's misdirect in chapter 130 when he shows the Hero Association executives reviewing the S-Class heroes and are highly suspicious of Metal Knight, but at the same time they praise Drive Knight saying that he is the one hero that they can openly rely on. As I said before, this was his goal, to manipulate the Hero Association with disinformation while also sullying Metal Knight while making himself out to be a saint. So how did Drive Knight, along with the organization, obtain Metal Knight's data in order to produce these suits? We saw in the manga's continuity that G5 salvaged the pieces of Metal Knight's drone in the Monster Association and likely siphoned its data similar to how we saw Child Emperor did, but those events don't happen in the webcomics continuity. However, we could see a point where it does happen in the webcomic, but it's much more subtle. In chapter 96, when Saitama returns to the Hero Association, picking up miniature overgrown Rover and Black S, Metal Knight's automated defense system detects them and begins to attack. But Saitama is none the wiser of what's actually happening here and destroys all the robots thinking that they're like attacking him. Cut to chapter 97 when we learn that Metal Knight picked up the security footage of these events in order to figure out what destroyed his defense robot. And when we see him reviewing the footage, on the screen to the left, we can see the brain robot from the organization. This brain robot, who I also suspect to be Araman in disguise, showed up to the Hero Association after Saitama destroyed Metal Knight's defense robots and salvaged the broken pieces and siphoned its data, similar to how G5 did in the Monster Association in the manga. Pretty sure this is how the organization obtained the information in order to make the power suits that the Neo heroes currently wear. Now, I believe these suits serve two purposes. First, they collect data from the user's battles. This data is then retrieved by the organization in order to strengthen their forces. It goes back to when we originally were introduced to the organization, when they allowed him and the Paradisers to steal their battle suits in order to get their battle data. The second purpose of the suits is to eventually take control of the users and force them to become soldiers soldiers of the organization when they decide to initiate their ultimate plan. In chapter 133, when we see Suiryu fighting Garo, his suit momentarily takes over and Suiryu says, it's overdoing it, I can't stop my attacks. This is foreshadowing for what is to eventually come. It goes back to what I said about God having two paths to eventually controlling humanity. One side through monsterization and one side through technology. Psychos and Drive Knight, Isis and Horus, two sides of the same coin for God, Osiris. That's not all though. Going back to chapter 130, Child Emperor finds a chip implanted in the head of a dragon level eel monster that was defeated by Blue. Then in chapter 135, Child Emperor finds another chip in a defeated monster and also discovers that artificial muscles were built into its body, which inflated its power several times over. He considers these cyborg monsters. This is clearly the organization manipulating these monsters and releasing them into the public so that the Neo heroes wearing their battle suits can fight them in order to collect better data. Another aspect of the organization further goes into the Eye of Horus, which is the further view of Drive Knight. In chapter 132, we see that the Neo heroes have a satellite tracking system, and in chapter 137, we find out that Blue wears mechanical contacts applied to him. These contacts are extremely important but I'll discuss their significance in a future video. Now we come to Drive Knight finally showing up in chapter 139, and once again, Genos is there as well. After fighting off zoo monsters together, Genos asks Drive Knight what he knows about Metal Knight, and this time we get the webcomic version of Drive Knight's manipulative gaslighting, as well as projecting of his machinations onto Metal Knight. He tells Genos that he told him that Metal Knight was his enemy to keep him safe from him, and that he robs others of military tech. He further says, 
says that your incineration cannons and reinforced muscle fibers and artificial nerves and the energy core you have, I thought it would be a problem if he obtained them. Now we see the reason why Drive Knight is interested in Genos and has been trying to manipulate him this whole time. He's interested in not only siphoning his technology made by Dr. Cruceno, but he also wants to turn him into a future soldier for the organization. Drive Knight then goes on to say that Metal Knight is evil and that he masked himself as a hero with a sense of justice and joined the Hero Association, but only to hijack their defense system with his own, and then claims that Metal Knight's monster containment facility is to brainwash, remodel them, and clone them into soldiers, turning them into bioweapons that obey his orders. This lines up with not only Child Emperor's discoveries, but also the same exact intentions that Drive Knight had for Neon in the manga. Drive Knight then goes on to say what I believe is a double entendre from one here, when he says that Metal Knight contacts people with dangerous ideas and grants them the power to realize those ideas by lending them his scientific power, then lets them go on a rampage, turning them into useful pawns. He throws societies into chaos and keeps wearing out security organizations such as the Euro Association and police, promoting the decline of national strength. He's trying to rule the world at the right moment when mankind's resistance is weakened. This is not only Drive Knight and the organization's methods, considering that they likely reached out to Fuzzy, the leader of the Neo Heroes this way. This also describes what happened with the Paradisers. But as we've seen, this is exactly how God himself works. The word pawn here is interesting as well. Drive Knight refers to his base form as pawn, and we know that Drive Knight's forms are based on Shogi, but I also believe this has a double meaning, referring to Drive Knight as a pawn of God. He also claims he hasn't shared his suspicions of Bafoy with the Hero Association because he fears he has collaborators among the top executives. He says he's telling Genos all of this because he believes they have a mutual enemy and mutual goals. Then Drive Knight drops the bomb and says that his village was also destroyed by the Mad Cyborg, the same who destroyed Genos' town and family. He claims that the Mad Cyborg is one of many autonomous weapons of destruction brought into the world from Bafoy Foy's countless weapon experiments. Whether it be cyborgs or AI-controlled robots, he has spawned countless murderous machines into the world, and that by exterminating these machines and collecting samples, Drive Knight has continuously modified and strengthened his body. This right here is Drive Knight subtly exposing himself. Since earlier he claimed Pafoy was the one who steals others' tech to strengthen his military might, this also falls in line with the behavior we've seen of the organization. In this panel, we also see Drive Knight's weapon box, which as I said before, resembles the God Cube, which is not a coincidence. He goes on to say that the Mad Cyborg ceased showing up in the past few years because Bafoy is likely preserving it as a trump card as it's too valuable to deploy needlessly and risk damage and is probably being kept idle within Bafoy's weapon storage. Again, this is a misdirect from one and more lies from Drive Knight. Considering that Drive Knight himself is the mad cyborg, that is the reason why he hasn't shown up in years. Also in this panel, we see the back of the mad cyborg, which in my opinion looks like a stripped down version of Drive Knight, which was probably purposely conveyed this way by one. So this this likely means that Metal Knight, aka Dr. Bafoy, accidentally created the Mad Cyborg. Now we could further speculate about who Drive Knight was originally, possible that he was Bafoy's son, and maybe Bafoy was trying to save him and converted him into a cyborg, or used his own son as a test subject, and then it goes back to what we said earlier about how God intervened during this process and caused his brain irregularity, transforming him into the Mad Cyborg, who just went on a rampage and destroy Genos' town, and of course, Metal Knight didn't want this. And this is also probably why Drive Knight knows so much about Bafoy, and why he has such a huge vendetta against him in the first place. But anyway, Drive Knight further says that Metal Knight has already made his move by using strengthened monsters, causing chaos and distress. He'll use his full arsenal to deal a final blow to an already shattered world. His army of robots will attack, and the Mad Cyborg will undoubtedly also appear. Then he asks Genos to join him and help attack Metal Knight before that happens. Genos then says that he needs time to think about it and consult with the people that he trusts. Afterwards, Drive Knight tells Genos his real name is Zero. I believe this refers to his placement in the organization. In the webcomic, the organization robots are referred to as machine gods, but in the manga, they go by numbers, as we've seen with G4 and G5. I believe Zero means Drive Knight is the original organization member, 
probably G0. Later, Genos relays the information that Drive Knight gave him to Saitama and Dr. Kuseno, but later that night, three robots show up and kill Dr. Kuseno. These robots are referred to as machine gods, just like the previous robots that we've seen from the organization. I believe that Drive Knight sent these gods to kill Kuseno to further frame Metal Knight and give Genos more motivation to join his side in fighting against Bafoy, but also stealing Kuseno's data, especially the data collected on Saitama, but we'll discuss that in another video. Then at the end of chapter 141, we see a legion of what appear to be Metal Knight-esque drones attacking a city. This goes back to the plans that Drive Knight revealed earlier about Metal Knight allegedly having an army of robots attack. This is Drive Knight's plan coming full circle and having the organization take over, while further falsely incriminating Metal Knight. And that's actually where the webcomic leaves off. It hasn't been updated for like over nine months, so I wish I could tell you more about what's going on, but unfortunately that's all we have for now. But anyway, all of this is why Drive Knight has been the mad cyborg hiding in plain sight this whole time. And you may also be thinking, well, you talked a lot about Drive Knight being evil, but you haven't really cleared Metal Knight. And that's partly true, but that's because in my next video, I'm going to be talking all about Metal Knight, why he's innocent, as well as his ties to Egyptian mythology, and why it possibly tells us how Genos vs. Drive Knight will ultimately play out. So, so today we're going to be continuing my series on the truth about One Punch Man, and to get better acquainted with what I'm going to be talking about in this video, please check out the previous video that I've made in this series on the truth about Genos and Drive Knight, because this video is going to be direct follow-up to that. Also, I'll have the link to the entire playlist in the description. So in this one, we're going to be talking about Metal Knight, aka Dr. Foy, the Egyptian god that he's based on, whether he's good or evil, where his base is possibly located, and his role in the Genos Drive Knight and Mad Cyborg storyline. So Metal Knight is based off of the Egyptian god Thoth. Thoth was the god of the moon, wisdom, writing, hieroglyphics, science, magic, art, and judgment. Now you might be thinking, wait, god of the moon? Did you say that god was based off of Osiris, who is also the moon god? So does that mean Metal Knight is evil? Well, while Thoth is associated with the moon, he's also one of the two deities who stood on either side of Ra's bark, and we've also previously established that Ra is Saitama. Thoth was also the secretary and counselor to Ra. It also it also seems that Thoth's relation to the moon is more so its ability to provide light at night, allowing time to still be measured without the sun. So now does this mean that Metal Knight is a good guy and he'll eventually become an ally of Saitama? I can't really say for sure, but what I can say is that in my opinion at least, I think he is more aligned to Saitama, or more so just the light, than he is to God the dark if we had to pick sides. Now as for Thoth being the god of wisdom, I think this parallels to us seeing Child Emperor go to him on multiple occasions for his guidance, as well as just the hero association in general putting so much faith into him. Thoth is also regarded as self-begotten and self-produced. This could also be Bafoy creating like his own proprietary technology, as well as like his legion of robots. Thoth is also credited with making the calculations for the establishment of the heavens, stars, earth, and everything in them. Now this could be a parallel to Metal Knight creating the entire Hero Association base. Thoth was also the master of both physical and moral law. Before he tells Child Emperor that he will make a rational choice for the sake of justice, and that more so just coincides with who Bafoy is as an entity. And of course, Thoth being the god of science lines up with Bafoy being the paramount robotic expert in the One Punch Man world, or at least implied to be. Also, Thoth is depicted as an ibis that has a headdress with four discs. And as you'll see here, this kind of lines up with how the Metal Knight Knight robot looks. But let's go back to God because Metal Knight does have like an inadvertent relationship to him, unfortunately. So in the Osiris myth, which we've talked about countless times in this series already. I hope you're familiar with it and its relation to One Punch Man. Thoth gives Isis the words to restore her husband Osiris, allowing the pair to conceive Horus. And as I've established in my previous video, Drive Knight is Horus, but also the Mad Cyborg. Drive Knight also says that Metal Knight is the one responsible for creating the Mad Cyborg, which I think is true. I also speculated that when Metal Knight was creating 
Drive Knight, God intervened at some point and led to him becoming the Mad Cyborg. As Janos previously said when he was explaining the Mad Cyborg to Saitama, the Mad Cyborg's body modification generated an irregularity in his brain. Meaning Metal Knight inadvertently created one of God's most crucial disciples in Drive Knight, which is Thoth giving Isis the words to restore Osiris, allowing them to conceive. Horus. Now also in the Osiris myth, Horus eventually resurrects Osiris, which in my opinion means that Drive Knight very well may resurrect God. We saw Drive Knight take Orochi's cells, which in my opinion he will later use to create an Orochi cyborg, which will then instinctually seek out the God Resurrection Altar under Z City, just as the original Orochi did, completing the ritual and resurrecting God to Earth. Also guys, if you've been enjoying my One Punch Man content or just content in general could you please subscribe to the channel thanks guys and now to wrap up the portion on thoth let's get into his role in the rivalry between set and horus aka genos versus drive knight because following a battle between horus and set thoth offers counsel and provides wisdom and in my opinion this is where the genos and drive knight storyline is headed as well since currently in the webcomic drive knight is trying to convince genos that metal knight is the ultimate evil and solely responsible for the mad cyborg destroying his family and as I've also established, Drive Knight has projected his and the organization's evil machinations onto Metal Knight. Culminating in chapter 141 of the webcomic with Drive Knight staging an attack on a city using Metal Knight drones that he created with the schematics the organization stole from Metal Knight. And once Genos and Drive Knight eventually confront Metal Knight as per Drive Knight's plan of seeking down his base with Genos in order to take him out, I assume at that point, before will reveal the truth about everything to Genos and also Drive Knight, as we have yet to hear Bafoy's side of the story in the series yet. We've always heard it from the side of Drive Knight, and I assume that he'll also most definitely come with receipts at this point, which Drive Knight has yet to produce since, you know, he's been lying this whole time. And this will line up with Thoth intervening in between Set and Horus and providing wisdom and counsel. Now, I don't know what the ultimate resolution that Metal Knight will have in this battle, but I assume that this will probably be the moment in the series where Genos finds out that Drive Knight is the Mad Cyborg. So now let's step away from Egyptian mythology and let's go into the manga and the webcomic and decide whether Metal Knight is good or evil. And to be honest, the answer isn't really that black and white. I think he's one of the rare instances of like a true neutral battle manga character. Although I believe what he ultimately wants is the good for humanity, just kind of in his own cold, pragmatic way, if that makes sense. He's kind of like Garo in that way, but more level-headed. We see in chapter 78 when he's discussing the Monster Association attack plan with Child Emperor, he feels that raiding the Monster Association in an effort to save Waganma is foolish and will result in multiple valuable hero deaths. And he's completely right. Like, if the plot wasn't so convenient to the S-Class heroes during the portion of them taking on the Cadres, surely at least three of them would have died, right? I mean, we saw what happened to the Council of Swordsmasters, characters that one was happy to let go of to prove a point, and their strength is implied to be S-Class level anyway. Metal Knight suggested that they carpet bomb the Monster Association instead, and while this would surely cost the life of Waganma, an innocent child and the son of one of the Hero Association's biggest donors, in his eyes it would be a small price to pay for a much wiser method of attack. And of course, many will see this as evil, but it's just ruthless pragmatism, which is, like I said, what Bafoy is in a nutshell. He's willing to trade one life in order to save millions, especially multiple valuable S-Class heroes who they themselves can go on to save millions by not needlessly sacrificing themselves in a flawed attack plan. Aside from that, somehow, Metal Knight already knew of the organization's threat to the world. I mean, like, you know, the Cyborg Drive Knight organization. But instead of lambasting about it without gaining all the facts or straight up lying about it like Drive Knight, he decided to be more calculated and simply relaying a warning to Child Emperor instead. In Chapter 83, he tells Child Emperor that he's not afraid of the Monster Association and that right now other evils want to harm the world and they will strike when humanity's defenders are weak. He also tells him not to be careful and to not trust anyone around him. This directly lines up with Drive Knight's behavior 
chapter 117, when he pressures Second Gar about the vulnerability of the Hero Association at that moment and demands to know if Blast will show up if it's attacked. I go further into this sequence in my previous video, so again, please check that out if you want to get more in detail into this. And like I said, somehow Metal Knight knew of Drive Knight and the organization's plan, but I assume that he can't just prove it yet or he just doesn't have all of the facts in order to make everyone aware yet so that's why he kind of just tells child emperor to trust no one so aside from all of that drive knight also claims before wants to take over the world and that raises the question of like what is his goal because following metal knight's story in the series we can vaguely see that he does indeed have some kind of ambition and to be honest i'm not really sure what it is yet in the volume 11 bonus chapter rangers we find out that the corrupt hero association executives were illegally selling monsters that Metal Knight was holding captive in the Hero Association cells for research. Metal Knight discovers this and says that he can't believe someone would try to profit off of them and he'll make sure the corrupt execs are expelled from the association and that the association's big shots disgust him and they are easy to manipulate that he'll let them run free a little longer. And that right there always kind of stuck out to me and kind of planted the seeds of suspicion with Metal Knight, whether they be good or bad. But let's go much further along into the story because now we're going into webcomic chapter 97. Because after reviewing the security footage of Saitama destroying his defense robots, Bafoy views Saitama's records and deems him possibly even stronger than the S-Class and says, on the off chance that he can challenge me, I'll observe him for now. Then going forward to chapter 135, we see Bafoy observing his monitors after talking to Child Emperor, and he says, referring to Child Emperor, that he can do what he wants. I won't be stopped by anyone. We also see him like observing Drive Knight and Saitama among a few others in these monitors. Now, as I've also mentioned in my previous video, I think one is playing misdirect with Metal Knight, like purposely making us suspicious of him. The same way that Drive Knight is doing to Genos and Segengar and the Hero Association by proxy. And like I said, while I don't fully understand his motives yet, since at least I know that Drive Knight is the true evil here, it's possible that Bafoy intends to like overthrow the Hero Association and become the new leader or establish like a new Hero Association or something, since he's obviously well aware of the corruption within it. Corruption that us the readers are coming more to light of as the story goes forward. This was like the main reason why Child Emperor left the Hero Association to join the Neo Heroes. This could be his pragmatic goal of absolute justice, not trying to control Control the world, as Drive Knight says, but to simply make the Hero Association like a true organization of justice, and not one of corruption and greed, which it is now. And to finish this video off, let's talk about the possible location of Metal Knight's base. So going back to Thoth being the god of the moon, I think that might be Metal Knight's relation to the moon, other than inadvertently creating Drive Knight for god. Meaning that his base might be on the moon? Like, maybe on the dark side of it or something? And if it's not there, then it might be in space. Like, he might have a space base or something. So hear me out. When Metal Knight's drone comes to examine Boros' ship in Chapter 36, we see it arrive from the sky in a pod. So, like, where did it come from? I mean, it clearly dropped down from somewhere, right? So was it coming from his space base or the moon? Also, in Volume 7's bonus chapter, Big Construction, we see the giant construction robot Metal Knight used to help create the new Hero Association. I've always thought this thing resembled, or at least was based off of, an ATAT -AT walker from Star Wars. And who made the ATAT -AT walker? The Empire. And where is the Empire's main base? The Death Star. It could also be another reason for the creator that Boros created when he kicked Saitama to the moon, other than representing like the Eye of Horus, and also the real life moon creator Osiris, you know, further paralleling to God. It also could, you know, be paralleling the Death Star, which also could be Metal Knight's base of operations. Now, I know that in the past, Child Emperor was Bafoy's assistant and that he was in his lab at some point, but I mean, maybe it wasn't like the moon base. Maybe that's like something entirely different that maybe not even Child Emperor knows about possibly. Just speculating here. I'm not really married to that, but it does seem like 
cool little possible twist, right? But anyway, that's it for the video today, guys. Let me know what you think about Metal Knight. Do you believe Drive Knight? Do you think Metal Knight is the true big ultimate evil here aside from God? Or is he, you know, kind of in the middle here? He's like a true neutral who does want to bring justice to the world, but just in a cold, stoic, pragmatic way. So the story that we're going to be talking about today is the secret aim of Ra. So as we know by now, Ra is the god of the sun and essentially like the strongest god that there was. And he also had many names and many forms. However, there was one name which had not been spoken since time began. And to know Ra's secret name was to have power over him and over the world that he had created. Now, on the other hand, Isis longed for such a power. She had dreamed that one day she would have a marvelous falcon-headed son called Horus, and she wanted the throne of Ra to give to her child. Now, there's multiple variations of this story, as well as with most of the ancient Egyptian mythology stories, but both of them always correlate to Isis giving Ra's power to Horus or Osiris. And I think that one is adapting a mixture of the both here because as we said Osiris is God you know the God from One Punch Man and Horus is Drive Knight but I'll get more into that later. Isis was the mistress of magic wiser than millions of men but she knew that nothing in creation was powerful enough to harm its creator being Ra and her only chance was to turn the power of Ra against himself and at last Isis thought of a cruel and cunning plan. So every day the sun god walked so every day Ra walked through his kingdom attended by a crowd of his spirits and lesser deities but Ra was growing old and his eyes were dim and he had even begun to drool. So one day Isis essentially snuck up behind Ra and watched him as he walked and she waited for his drool to land on the ground and once it eventually did she made sure Sure that the coast was clear and she scooped up Ra's saliva and what she eventually did with this was mix it with earth and form it into a serpent and the next day when Ra came walking through his kingdom with his group of spirits and deities she approached the crossroads and her spell on the clay serpent began to work and it came to life and as Ra passed it bit him on the ankle and Ra gave a scream that was heard all throughout creation this essentially just wrecked Ra, like this was the worst pain he had ever felt, and he was essentially powerless from the poison that it had given him. So it eventually got to the point of where all of the other gods came to Ra's aid and trying to figure out like what was wrong with him, you know, what's going on, but Isis was also there. And she was like, hey, uh, you know, I could help you, Ra. You know, I could cure you of this poison but you're gonna have to tell me your secret name. You know, the name that you've never said out loud before? And Ra, of course, tries to walk around this question, like not wanting to give her the true name, of course, because we found out that if he does, then you have power over Ra and all of creation, essentially. But Isis keeps going on. She's like, nah, the only way I can heal you is if you give me your name. And it eventually gets to the point of where the poison and the pain is just unbearable. And Ra's like, okay, I'll tell you. And he makes sure that all of the other gods, like, you know, move away. And he whispers into Isis's ear, what his true name is. And after he says it, he's like, in time, you can give it to your son or husband, but warn them to never betray the secret. And Isis nodded and began to chant a great spell that drove the poison out of the limbs of Ra, and he rose up stronger than before. Isis then shouted for joy at success for plan, because she knew that one day Horus, her son, or Osiris, her husband, would sit in the throne of Egypt and wield the power of Ra. So that's the story right there. So now let's break it down and correlate it to One Punch Man. So this posits that there's a possibility that at some point, Psychos is going to poison Saitama with like his own power, essentially, right? And it's like, how do we get to that point? Because things aren't really set up like that yet, right? So let me go over how I think that's going to happen. So Psychos is currently with Fubuki in the webcomic. Like, I guess they're at the Blizzard Group's base of operations or whatever. And Fubuki was like trying to get through to Psychos' mind to figure out, you know, what's going on with her and for a lesser extent, God. Now, this means that Psychos is eventually going to escape from Fubuki, which I think a lot of us speculated is going to happen. But this seems to make it all but assured. And how is Psychos going to escape from Fubuki? And I think a good catalyst for that is what actually happened in the latest chapter of the webcomic when it was revealed that imposter Metal Knight drones have like invaded the cities and are just destroying everything. Now I say imposter because in my opinion, these are refabricated Metal Knight drones that were made by Drive Knight and the organization in order to frame
Game Metal. I've talked about this before. Check out my Truth About Genos and Drive Night video. But I assumed that that could possibly get to the attention of Fubuki, or maybe they're even like attacking the area that she's in, and this will allow Psychos to escape. Now, after that, at some point, I think that Psychos is going to meet up with Drive Night, or at least just the organization. Now, why would they meet up with her? Well, it's because of Orochi. Aside from their Egyptian counterparts, you know, Drive Night being Horus, Psychos being Isis, their common factor in the actual series itself is Orochi. Because Psychos created Orochi, of course, and Drive Night now has Orochi cells in his possession, because it's important imply that he's going to recreate Orochi, right? Now, it's possible that Drive Knight comes to Psychos because he needs help with recreating Orochi, because he wants to make, like, this big, all-powerful being that will assure him to take over the Earth, right? Stop any other heroes that are in his way. And creating, like, this new, big cyborg Orochi can assure that, but maybe he's having some difficulty with it. So he comes to the original creator and it's like, hey, can you help me finish making this Orochi? And then, you know, whatever they talk about eventually gets to the point of where Saitama is in the discussion. Now you're saying like, well, how are they aware of Saitama really? Well, it's because I think Drive Knight has Saitama's data that was collected from Dr. Kuseno. Now back in chapter 140 of the webcomic, Saitama goes to meet up with Dr. Kuseno along with Genos at like his lab. And eventually gets to the point of where Kuseno says to Saitama like, hey, would you allow me to take your precious data of your body, which is so strong despite being flesh and blood? And Saitama's a little hesitant about it, but Kuseno eventually convinces him by giving him some barbecue. And once Saitama Saitama gets into the machine that's going to collect his data, we see him like sleeping and there's drool coming from his mouth. Uh, I think this could be a parallel to the original story where it said, you know, Ra was growing old, his eyes were dim, he had even began to drool, and Isis eventually collected the drool to make the serpent that poisons him. But after this sequence, we're not really sure if Kuseno like fully collected the data because we get really any insight into what had happened. Because conveniently, organization robots show up, you know, kill Kuseno, attack Gen. Uh, but they're all eventually killed by Genos and Saitama. But, and we don't see them do anything. But in my opinion, I think that one way or another, they did steal this data from Kuseno, possibly off panel. Very likely off panel if we don't see it happen in a future chapter. And now that the organization has this data, that means that Drive Knight has this data as well. And he's going to obviously use this for his benefit, either to improve himself, his cyborg Orochi, or both. And I think he tells this to Psychos. But I think one of the major things here is that that the data wasn't complete. Like when this robot showed up, we saw Saitama broke out of the chamber. So it's very likely that all of the data wasn't recorded. Like they only got, I don't know, 70% of it or something. And Drive Knight's like, hey, I got all of this data from this super powerful guy. And in order to complete, you know, this Orochi or just making myself super powerful, I'm gonna need all of it. So I need your help with taking down this guy and getting the remaining data from him or AKA his secret. And I think that this is where Ra's, you know, secret name, getting his power, comes from. Now, I assume that Drive Knight is going to give Psychos, you know, all of the tools that she needs to make this poison to infect Saitama, and it's going to be made from his own DNA, I assume, from whatever data Kuseno collected from him, or maybe it's even from the drool, or just collecting his DNA in some way. And then Psychos is going to poison Saitama. Now, either it literally plays out like it does in the story, like she crafts a serpent and it strikes him, because obviously serpents are associated with psychos, because like I said, she's freaking Isis. Now, maybe it's not exactly that. You know, maybe she does something else and she sneaks up on Saitama and poisons him. But to be honest, we've already seen this play out in the story, believe it or not, because one teased us with it in chapter 16. Like after Saitama is leaving the Hero Association, after he, you know, has that little meeting with Snack, Snack follows him home, and as Saitama's like on that path, he pops out of the grass and attacks Saitama with like his serpent strike thing. And it's clearly represented here as like a snake about to bite him. But of course, Saitama just smacks him away because, you know, He's snack. But this is pretty much the story, the secret name of Ra, right? Like, this is what we went over. And if you watch my other videos in this series, you've already seen that I've showed you other examples of one doing this. And this is just another one. Pretty interesting, right? Again, maybe confirmation bias. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But I do think that this is one foreshadowing that this is eventually going to happen to Saitama. That he will be poisoned, just as Ra was by Isis. Now, after Saitama is poisoned, I assume that this is going to be the point of where he is quote unquote defeated. And he will essentially be powerless for the first time in the story, or at least post limiter removal. And this will bring us to the point of where Psychos demands 
to know Saitama's secret, such as Isis wanted to know Ra's secret name. Now, what is the secret that she's trying to get from Saitama? Not really sure. I don't think it's like literally his name, even though that is an interesting aspect of Saitama because his name is Saitama, but that's all we know. We don't know what like his real full name is, or even if his name truly is Saitama. He never divulges any information about himself, to be honest. We don't really know anything about him, but in context of the series, it has something to do with his power. So it's possible that there's some kind of secret about him removing his limiter that he didn't divulge to the audience. And once he gives this information to Psychos, then she's able to give that to Drive Knight so that they can fully create Orochi or whatever. And another thing that makes me think that this is very likely going to happen is because the group that Saitama is currently with in the webcomic is the Hero Name Victims Association. Name Victim. Remember, Ra giving his secret name to Isis because he was a victim of her poisoning him. I think this is one winking to us at like, hey, it's all going to be connecting here. Now in story, the hero name victim association is like a group of lower class heroes that were given just awful names by the hero association. And they're kind of protesting to get their names changed. You know, along with Saitama being called, you know, Cape Baldy or Bald Cape or whatever. But I think this is also one, you know, winking to the secret name of Ra story. Now, why is Saitama going to give his quote unquote secret to Psychos? Because, you know, in the original story with Ra, the pain got so bad or he was eventually going to die or something where he just told her. But I don't really think Saitama would do that. He's very selfless, very tough mentally and physically and like he just wouldn't so selfishly submit like that right it would be more so like if somebody else was in danger so in this hypothetical sequence saitama would be powerless right and he wouldn't be able to help or defend anyone so it's possible that psychos is about to i don't know kill the hero names victim association or somebody else and he's like hey all right don't kill them i'll tell you my secret and i assume that's how it's going to happen now, also in the original story, after that happens, Isis cures Ra of the poison. And I don't really don't think that's going to happen in One Punch Man. Like, why would Psychos heal Saitama afterwards? It just doesn't make sense. So I assume that this is when Fubuki comes in. Because, you know, as we've talked about in other videos, Fubuki is based off of Sekhmet, the goddess of healing, also the daughter of Ra. And we've seen in the series, obviously, that Fubuki does have some serious healing power. She stopped Genos from exploding. She healed the tank top master. And I think that this is where more of her healing is going to come in because she's going to cure Saitama of the poison that Psychos made with his DNA. And that will also bring them closer together because, you know, the relation between Sekhmet and Ra is, you know, father and daughter. But I think in this series, it's more so meant that Fubuki will be Saitama's love interest, but that's a story for another time. But once Psychos gets this secret from Saitama and gives it to Drive Knight, like I said, he's going to either use it to master his Orochi cyborg or also power himself or both, because that also goes into the Egyptian story. Like Isis got this power for Horus, for him to become the king of Egypt or for Osiris to become the king of Egypt using Ra's power. and. You know, as we've also talked about, Osiris is God in the One Punch Man story, but also Osiris is the husband of Isis and Horus is their son. And I've also talked about this before, but Drive Knight is the son of God technically because he's one of his disciples. Like that's how he became the Mad Cyborg because at some point he accepted God's influence. Like possibly when he was becoming a cyborg. And that's why he created the organization, as well as why Psychos created the Monster Association. Both of these, you know, main antagonist groups in One Punch Man are products of God. You know, Isis, Horus, Osiris. Organization, Monster Association, both their purpose is to essentially resurrect God one way or another, but also just to hand over humanity and Earth to him. Right, and, and it's also a great contingency in case one of them fails, because as we saw, the Monster Association failed, so now the organization picks up the pieces, as they have been. And both of them are trying to create a Rochi, right? Because we saw on the mural underneath the Monster Association that a Rochi or a worthy sacrifice equivalent to him needs to be placed on the altar to resurrect God to the earth. We saw that Psychos created Rochi, and we saw that Drive Knight collected Orochi's cells before he left the Monster Association War. Obviously, he intended to recreate him. So, once Orochi is recreated and perfected using Saitama's power or DNA or whatever, 
uh, he will, uh, one way or another, instinctively, as it was also stated before, go down beneath the Monster Association and go to the altar and resurrect God. Like, that's the whole thing here. Both paths just lead to God's resurrection, just as it did with Osiris in the original story. So yeah, that's uh, what I foresee happening. There is going to be a stretch of chapters where Saitama is ultimately powerless, and he unfortunately will be the direct result of why God is resurrected to the earth by them using him. <laughs> But yeah, let me know what you think about all this in the comments. Again, I'm not trying to convince you guys of anything. We're just having fun here talking. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But also, I want to thank everyone who watched all of my Egyptian mythology, Truth About One Punch Man videos. I really do appreciate it. And uh, if you liked the video, please give it a like. And, you know, if you haven't already, please subscribe as well. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one.